we are streaming and recording. Okay, so let me get started. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll get another link anyway and start passing it around. <laughs> oh, God, by the time we get to this, we'll be at the top of the hour, almost. So that'll be fine. We just start an hour late. Uh, it was an hour of experiment. And uh, this way people understand some of the frustrations that we deal with when we try to bring extra people on bandwidth. It was actually a miracle uh, we had the Grand Mountain I'm Judith Ager uh, on as long as we did the other night. And, of course, what happened there was a uh, issue where she had to uh, be uh, take off, which was not uh, technical. It was uh, had to do with uh, a completely different phenomenon. And uh, aside from all of that, uh, waiting on the link, and uh, I'll start playing around with that when it's handed uh, to me. Um, what we're going to do then is uh, just dive into uh, my analysis, and uh, what we have here is that uh, we're hearing everything okay, other people are writing, this is good, people are participating, Roman can hear us again, Sarah can hear us again, uh, all of a set, uh, I've got a new uh, link coming in, and uh, this one I'm going to uh, take, you'll hear echoing for a second, and uh, what I'm going to do is now grab that share. And uh, we're, we're right here. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, it's the same stream, uh, likely, uh, but I'll change the link anyway. Uh, we already got one thumbs down, of course, from uh, my, uh, my primary gang stalker, aside from the multimillionaire who pays him to do this, Richard K. Cole. That, of course, is no violation of his privacy. Everybody knows who he is. Hey, Rich, I fucked your mother and she stank. Oh, I realize you don't have a mother. You had two fathers. That's why you came out a faggot. All right. And uh, they hear us now in Cincy. Okay. Hope everybody enjoyed hearing that. Now uh, we're going to uh, go on here. And uh, nobody likes you, Richard. Yeah. Nobody likes you, Cole. Uh, and uh, the Marine Corps says you don't represent them because they don't like faggots like you. So uh, there you go. That's why they kicked your ass out. Okay. So that keep him occupied. So I may pass this link out uh, around while we head towards the top of the hour. Everyone has reconnected, and um, that's cool. Good. And um, with that, of course, uh, we've got this. And now, uh, so this link will be for new people who are coming in uh, throughout the period of time that I'm talking. Uh, we'll be on for uh, as long as it takes, which uh, we don't want to keep uh, our man Pavel up too late, but he's in for the long haul, and he's pretty much been uh, dedicated to uh, uh, going for longer periods of time than uh, is normal for the human body. I uh, want to say a shout out to Gregory Strasbaugh. Uh, he's an individual who, of course, has been uh, listening as well and uh, participating. And uh, everyone else who's there has pretty much had their names mentioned that uh, has been actively participating. So um, let me take a look at this. Okay, our latest link is very similar to the last. It actually doesn't look that much different. So um, it's uh, pretty much maybe this just the same stream. Uh, I'm going to compare this to the next uh, post that I'm working on, in which case, uh, if it is pretty much identical, then I'll just leave it be. Uh, and that would be at least a relief. So, uh, yeah, it looks like the same post, really. So that's fine. So it just restarted. So he, he provided the link, and it's the same one. So um, I can get started now. All right. Um, we're starting a few minutes before the top of the hour, and uh, that's fine. Basically, what we're doing is uh, very much for posterity's sake. We are recording this so that people can hear it later because we don't know how many people are going to be participating on a Friday night. We did want to get this special report out uh, in the event that something took place. And uh, this was called, of course, uh, by uh, Paul Edward because he had read a number of uh, articles. And uh, many times these articles that present news are presented as quote-unquote opinion, and that presents an easy out uh, for everyone uh, because many people, for some reason, don't want to be held uh, responsible for what they say. Uh, what you have is essentially a uh, lack of uh, accountability on part of uh, people who posit uh, suggestions or advisements in terms of action. And um, in order to present that, they present themselves as basically a concerned citizen and that they have some observations to make. I, of course, operate on a uh, far 
uh, more aggressive level than that, and that's why I get the gang stalkers. This is why I get uh, the uh, people who are so obsessed with me and uh, who are obsessed with uh, doing everything they can to take me down. Because in the uh, kind of patriarchy that we have in the um, United States uh, today, uh, one of the biggest issues that we have is the ability to hold people accountable um, in the patriarchy no one who is a white male is held accountable uh, a great example would be the uh, senate judiciary committee uh, which was questioning brett kavanaugh uh, in terms of his appointment for the supreme court uh, they stripped the rhetoric of self-defense down to its most basic layer which be i'm a white man so i'm right you're wrong she's lying because she's got a cup between her legs, but because I've got a cup between my legs, I'm not lying. Uh, because she's a cunt, she remembers nothing, but because I'm a dick, I remember everything. That is essentially the concept of patriarchy. There is no accountability. You get all of the benefits, but none of the responsibilities. Uh, I, of course, uh, am personally one of the most irresponsible people you'll ever meet. Socially is a different matter. I'm far more socially responsible uh, than the overwhelming majority of people out there that um, are white males uh, who unfortunately hold uh, the majority of power uh, without earning it. They are privileged that. They are gifted that on the basis of skin color at birth. All of that is changing now. And as a result of all that changing, they are reacting. And that's what that's basically one of the factors, believe it or not, that's leading to the crisis in the Black Sea. Uh, because Vladimir Putin's entire appeal is to the reactionary elderly white male and those types of females who are so invested in terms of their entire identity into patriarchy that they basically surrender to the paradigm. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that uh, Russia Today, uh, the primary media state-sponsored propaganda machine of the Russian Federation, has emphasized, uh, along with uh, many other media outlets in a, essentially a media monopoly that is known as the Russian Federation under Vladimir Putin, what they emphasize is that Russia has, quote-unquote, a masculine foreign policy. Uh, now, a masculine foreign policy means shoot to kill, invade, uh, take what you can, uh, steal everything that's not nailed down, uh, rape, uh, just, uh, you, you know, offend, uh, insult, uh, and then insinuate. Uh, after you rape somebody, uh, make certain that you destroy their credibility uh, by saying that they're crazy, uh, that they have uh, ulterior motives. Uh, I noticed this from our man, of course, here, who has uh, a shout-out to him, uh, Richard Bremer. And he says, referring to Ukraine, election is coming over there. And Poroshenko is trying to do something. That was provocation. Both sides can be nasty. Richard, you've got to stop trolling the internet and watching YouTube videos. All the aggregates, all the artificial intelligence aggregates take you to the Russian bullshit. And the Russians have invaded Ukraine. They've taken Crimea on the basis that Russians live there. Now, back in the days when Adolf Hitler was trying to protect Germans from persecution in Pavel Edward's own nation, where he was born, in Czechoslovakia, of course, he was in Moravia, uh, there were Germans living in the Sudetenland, it was well known they were being persecuted. When Adolf Hitler integrated them into the Reich, everyone said, that's German aggression. But when the Russians do it and say, oh, the Russians live over here so we can invade and we can take this piece of land because this gives us enormous strategic advantage, then all the white trash pieces of shit say, oh, the Russians are just saving Russians. Well, fuck that shit. Richard Bremer, grow the fuck up. <laughs> Stop watching that shit. Stop eating that shit. It's like you're going into a kitty litter box. You're digging up all the cat shit and you're swallowing it and you know what effect that has on the brain. And I can't believe... Uh, our sister in struggle, the Anara Rishan, put a like, <laughs> clicked a like on your comment. Now, don't feel alone because, of course, the very man who kind of presaged what you said wrote that opinion piece that 
Pavel Edward was reading from. And one of the things that Pavel brought up was, oh, there's this other perspective. Oh, in balance, elections are coming up in Ukraine. This individual is not very popular. So maybe there was provocation. Okay, how does one provoke another nation into ramming their goddamn ships? I mean, was there a tractor beam, Star Trek style? I mean, come on, people. Get your heads out of your ass. I can't even believe that people are fucking reading this shit and relaying it as if this were fact. Okay, I am here not to deal in opinion. I'm here to deal in fact. So we're going to dive into those facts now. And we'll start with a little bit of context news all around. But the first thing to tell you is we're going to go a little bit of reference to a great military historian that I preceded myself that has been honored for generations known as Karl von Clausewitz. Karl von Clausewitz was the great Prussian military genius who wrote books defining war, defining modern war as we understand it, uh, defining the laws of war, because war does require laws. Without laws, war isn't war, then it's just rape, pillage, plunder, uh, running amok, uh, just taking whatever you want. Without laws, there is no prosecution of conflict that leads to resolution. That's the entire point of war, is resolution. The point of war is not total destruction, which is what many Americans think, because, of course, Americans have been raised in a psychotic paradigm. They're indoctrinated to think that war means anything and everything. That anything goes, everything goes, that you're going to do whatever it takes to quote unquote win. Well, what, what is the winning? What is the ultimate endpoint? What is the victory? Well, to Americans, that's often perceived as total destruction, total destruction until someone has unconditional surrender. Well, if that's the case, America hasn't been able to prosecute anyone to total destruction ever, ever, whether it was the Axis whether it was any conflict they participated in since. So that means America has failed in every military endeavor. So that brings us back to the people who know war, the Germans, and, of course, their cultural predecessors, the Prussians. And, of course, all of this is the area of the world where my executive producer, uh, Paul Edward, sources from. And within that area of the world, Karl von Clausewitz observed that war is an extension of politics. Where diplomacy has failed force is deployed. And when force is applied, it is applied only to the point where it succeeds in resolution. Otherwise, there's no point in applying force. You may as well stay home. You may as well surrender to whatever new situation has developed. So bear that in mind. All war is politics by other means. So if we're talking about a threat of a crisis escalating into war, Let's start with the fucking politics. And those politics have led to war back here at home, specifically where I live, in California. And I'm going to take us from California to the Black Sea. First, when it rains, it pours. Rain is triggered debris that has flowed as storms have rolled through the fire-scarred regions across California. It's a cold front that brought wind and heavy rain, unleashed debris flows in fire-ravaged neighborhoods, triggering further evacuations and school closures up and down the state in wake of the fires. After Inferno came the flood. Amidst all this was a nice surprise. My city and county of San Francisco is getting a 415 United States, 415 million United States dollar windfall. Now, I'll go into the context behind that when I'm on with Justin White. And uh, we'll try and explore how our African-American female mayor, what traditionally was referred to respectfully as a negress, what our negress mayor, London Breed, will do and her board of supervisors in terms of deciding how to spend or expend this 415 million United States dollar windfall. Do that a bit when we have Justin on with us. For right now, paradise is blocked. Paradise, California. And a big question for Paradise is when? When can people return, if ever? Across Butte County, California, about 50,000 people have been displaced from Paradise in the nearby towns of Concow, 
and Megalia. Some of them barely escaped and have been so shaken by the wildfire that they vowed they have no intention of ever returning after barely escaping with their lives. Others are content to set their lives by law enforcement's timetable. Others wait and wonder when they can go back as rain makes their return even more complicated. Two months, three months, six months. People want to know what to do. Where do they go from here? Authorities have said that eastern and southern portions of Paradise might be open to residents early next week, if the weather allows. Parts of Konko, Old Magalia, and Yankee Hill could follow later in the week. After an initial 24-hour period for residents, those areas would then be open to the public. Authorities are also hearing from a third group, evacuees who are desperate to visit their properties, but lives in parts of paradise that will likely remain off limits for several more weeks at least. Senators Diane Feinstein and Kamala Harris have stated in letter to their colleagues the state of California needs well over 9 billion United States dollars in disaster aid to recover from this fall's wildfires. The money could come in an end of the year spending package. Now, the Democrats no, this is war, though nobody speaks of it out loud. They're looking ahead to 2020. Democrats and Republicans see costs and benefits of Trump's MAGA rallies, his Make American Great rallies. Uh, Democrats say the rallies helped Republican candidates in reactionary areas, perhaps skipping the scales or tipping the scales, as they say in the English. I tend to signify and uh, add an accent uh, to my phrases at the worst possible moments. But Democrats have agreed that these rallies helped Republican candidates in extremely reactionary areas like palliative care centers, hospices, uh, places where old people go to die, for you young kids who don't know what those terms mean, or uh, residential communities for the retirees, like senior centers, uh, or insane asylums, places like that. In areas like that, where such uh, places dominate the economy, uh, such facilities, they tip the scales in a couple of Senate races. But Trump's presence, his very presence, also spurred a higher turnout of Democratic voters. That's what made California, the battleground in the most literal sense, being attacked by a series of paramilitary generated firestorms. California is the decision state from whence the blue tide rises that is taking back America. In the three weeks, it's been three weeks now since Election Day, Republican fortunes have slipped from bad to worse. The latest evidence came Monday. When T.J. Cox, the Democratic candidate, grabbed the lead in the nation's last undecided House race over Republican Representative David Valadao in California's 21st District. And by Wednesday, as a couple of additional counties in the Central Valley District completed the count, Cox solidified his lead, giving Democrats their 40th pickup in the midterm election. With nearly all the ballots now counted nationwide, Democratic candidates overall have amassed well over 60 million votes. That's an enormous increase over the previous record for a midterm. 44.5 million won by Republican candidates in 2010. And it's indicative of the huge turnout the midterm election produced. The Democratic edge, 53.5% of the total vote, compared with 45% for Republican candidates, is also huge. There are 83 percentage point lead is one of the biggest for either party since World War II, as Americans understand it. Those numbers, by the way, come courtesy of the invaluable Dave Wasserman of the Cook Political Report. That's my source. The 235 House seats the Democrats will hold in January corresponds closely to their margin in the popular vote. Gerrymandered districts held back Democratic gains in a number of state legislatures, including Washington, Michigan, and North Carolina, but proved less of a factor overall in congressional races. California proved the great, pivotal, disaster area for the Republicans. At the top of the ticket, their candidate for governor, John Cox, won just over 38% of the vote. 
the worst showing for a major party candidate for governor in the state in 40 fucking years. Down the ballot, the pattern continued. Every House race that Democrats targeted ended up falling their way. The Republican wipeout in the Golden Bear Republic of California has generated tough questions for the soon-to-be minority leader of the House, Representative Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield. McCarthy repeatedly asked his California colleagues to vote with Trump on issues that hurt them in their districts. Racism, stand tall with racism, anti-immigration, paranoia, pro-Russia. All that helped to solidify his relationship with the president but contributed to all the losses. Now, in the national sense, on the southern border of California, the number of immigrants in the United States nationwide, though I'm monitoring it from my own state, the number of immigrants in the United States illegally nationwide is the lowest it's ever been in more than a decade. That's according to new data from the nonpartisan Pew Research Center. And yet, the Trump administration is preparing to extend troop stay on the border, even though their mission is entirely unclear. Pentagon officials are considering whether to keep the United States troops along the southwest border an additional 45 days, potentially extending their mission to assist the Border Patrol into next year. Meanwhile, south of that border, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador will be sworn in as President of Mexico this weekend. His relationship with Trump is already complicated. The question being, will it become toxic? And nationwide, in the United States, north of that border, the number of uninsured children in the United States increased last year under the Trump administration, reversing over a decade of progress. I'll be covering those health issues of universal care Either a bit with uh, my transmission with Justin White, perhaps uh, if Judith Agert returns with us on the Wednesday after that. If she doesn't for at least this Wednesday, I'll be covering it then. I'll be covering it the Sunday thereafter, because this problem's not going to go away. It's always timely. Now, this I'll have to cover in another transmission, but I have to bring it up now. Because it's part of the worldwide war of Russia against vaccines. As I pointed out before, it's been confirmed, verified, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that all the anti-vaccine propaganda sources from motherfucking Russia are dear grand madam, the Ramona Halitha Henry. She has, of course, put up some links on her own post that displays proudly on my page concerning these Russian sources for the anti-vaccine campaign. And, of course, I'll take a quick look at them now and bring them up for you yourself to source. Basically, it has, of course, been identified while I scroll down here. Of course, she did a massive job with this. If she were with us tonight, of course, I would recommend everyone follow up on the links that she provides. Uh, Otherwise, of course, uh, here we are. A study published in the American Journal of Public Health proved that Russian bots and trolls be enormously active in sending anti-vaccination messages via Twitter. That's sourcing from Forbes.com. I want you all to realize that if you're anti-vaccination, you're a motherfucking sucker. You're a Russ sucker. A Russian fuck sucker. Because the number of measles cases around the world soared under the Trump administration from 2016 to 2017. Measles surged 31% last year and the year before yesteryear. So says a joint report from the World Health Organization of the United Nations, the WHO, the WHO, and the CDC of the United States, the Center for Diseases Control and Prevention. They worked on this jointly and confirmed that measles outbreaks were reported all over the globe, with an estimated 110,000 deaths confirmed yesteryear, those that we were able to identify and confirm worldwide. 
That's 110,000 deaths directly at the door, at the foot of the door of Vladimir Putin, directly at his feet in terms of his promoting anti-vaccination ideology so that you motherfucking cocksuckers who love Russia so much refuse to vaccinate your children and kill them in the name of your God, Vladimir Putin. You worship Vladimir Putin more than you worship Jesus Christ. Vladimir Putin's your motherfucking Messiah. If he stood in front of you, you'd suck his cock, swallow his dregs, and drink his piss afterwards as a downer, as a chaser. Then you'd eat his shit as dessert. That's because you're a piece of shit. Fuck you. God damn you. Burn in hell eternal. You're as responsible for those kids' deaths as he is if you're anti-vaccine. And if you're a Republican. And if you're a Libertarian. Or even if you're an anarchist. Because the only people you help in all those cases is motherfucking Russia and their ideology. Health officials confirmed all the gaps in vaccine coverage were fueled by the spread of of state-sponsored falsehoods sourcing out of Russia about the measles vaccine throughout Europe. The 110,000 child deaths were all in motherfucking Europe. They were all white children. These aren't blacks in Africa. These aren't browns in Latin America. These aren't yellows in Asia. We couldn't even count those. We don't even have census statistics for those. Every single one of these deaths was 110,000 white Nordic Aryan babies that will never live to reproduce other white people. The white race is being exterminated by you motherfucking white trash pieces of shit who love Vladimir Putin. God damn you. So, all of this complacency brings us to essential politics now. A tense G20 has begun in Argentina. The future of global trade will hinge on a high-stakes dinner between Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Trump announced on his way to Buenos Aires he won't meet with Vladimir Putin because of all of the controversy back home that exposes him to be a traitor and a Putinista stooge. The Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, is going to meet separately with all three world leaders Because Japan is at the top of the fucking world. Japan won World War II. The Japanese leader is going to make his deals and his decisions personally and privately with all leaders separately because he's the man who runs the world. The rest of you fuckers just live on it. While the United States, Canada, and Mexico will be signing their new trade pact. Leaders of those three countries are expected to ink the deal on the sidelines of the G20 summit, if they haven't done so already, though their legislatures will need to ratify it afterward. Now, President Trump was in Argentina for the G20 summit since this morning, but his mood has been reported as terrible, and he's spooked and completely distracted. He's shit in his pants, like the human trash piece of shit that he is. Now, that's not too surprising after the latest Russia investigation bombshell. Michael Cohen pleading guilty to lying to Congress. Cohen, the president's one-time lawyer and fixer, had originally said talks between himself and Trump about a proposed Trump Tower project in Moscow ended in January of 2016, right before the start of primary season. Cohen now admits that was all a lie, and one he told out of a sense of obligation to Trump. The revelations be significant because they appear to show Trump was engaged in business dealings with Russia in the midst of a campaign in which Moscow interfered to help elect him. In response to all this, Trump called Cohen a weak person. Then he got on Air Force One and promptly canceled his planned meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the G20. Trump still has meetings with half a dozen other world leaders, including important talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping about trade and the ongoing trade war with communist China. This is all due to Robert Mueller showing some of his cards. This is impacting world war. What happens here at home? The special counsel will detail how former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort, who wasn't in court today to my knowledge, violated his plea deal 
by lying to investigators. Now, 18 months into his investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election and its links to President Trump, Robert S. Mueller III has retained his ability to surprise. Repeatedly, Mueller has caught outsiders, including White House lawyers, entirely unawares with major developments in his case. That happened again Thursday with Michael Cohen's guilty plea to a charge of lying to Congress. As Trump lashed out, accusing Cohen, his former personal attorney, of lying to get a lighter sentence, Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, just now returned from motherfucking Russia to get his orders directly from Vladimir Putin to relay to Donald Trump. Rudy Giuliani, Trump's current attorney, insisted that Cohen's sworn statements were consistent with the president's. Now, that condemns Donald Trump. That damns him. That's damning. The disarray in Trump's camp is beyond obvious. They're in total fucking meltdown. I want you white trash people to make a spin on that. Tell me how great your president is now. How much of a leader he is. How inspiring he is. All this week's events reinforced a central theme of the investigation. Mueller and his team have amassed thousands of emails. Tons. Literally tons of written records. And hundreds of hours of witness testimony. White House lawyers, by contrast, have to rely heavily on what the client, the puppet president of motherfucking Russia, is willing and able to tell them without consulting his own personal handler on a face-to-face basis to receive direct orders, Vladimir Putin. Increasingly, Mueller knows much more than anyone in the White House, including your puppet president, and the pace of his inquiry is only accelerating. Now, Trump's habit of lying about matters small and large has created a constant concern for his legal team. They've long resisted the idea of his sitting for an interview with Mueller's prosecutors for fear Trump would commit perjury. That brings us to the Cohn brothers. Now, the lawyer, the loyal lawyer fixer for President Donald Trump, Michael Cohen, pleading guilty in Manhattan federal court on Thursday. To which charges and to what end? With Trump now at war with someone who for years was his most loyal lieutenant and fixer. Cohen's court appearance underscored the peril he represents for the Putin puppet president. These are the sorts of developments that would, under normal circumstances, end a presidency. Meanwhile, Trump has been forced to take a stand against motherfucking Russia, declining meetings with the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin. And factoring into all of this, or the foundation for that turn of events, Michael Cohen's towering guilty plea. For years, Michael Cohen worked with Donald Trump, and now he's posing as a double legal threat to the president of Israel, as Trump is known in Russia. He's known as the president of Israel, not the president of the United States. Now, Cohen, obviously of Jewish descent, was helping Trump administer his Israeli presidency and he was previously implicated or implicative of that means he implicated Trump in a felony involving hush money and now he's pleaded guilty to lying to Congress about the extent of Trump's efforts to develop a luxury tower in Moscow all throughout the 2016 presidential campaign Cohen said he lied about this out of loyalty to help Trump's political messaging The president, who has repeatedly contended he has no financial interest connected at all to Russia, called Cohen a weak person who was making up a story. And two hours later, Trump abruptly cancels his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin at this weekend's Group of 20 summit in Buenos Aires, citing Russia's seizure of three Ukrainian naval vessels and 24 sailors. Cohen's guilty plea, at minimum, exposed several more statements by Trump that were untruthful, or to be charitable, misleading. Trump's company did indeed plan to give Vladimir Putin a 50 million United States dollar Moscow penthouse. The idea arose as the Trump Organization negotiated a real estate deal for a 100-story building during the 2016 campaign. The president's former attorney, Michael Cohen, testified in court he lied to Congress about this plan, which ultimately fizzled, to protect Trump. Trump, of course, says 
I have nothing to do with Russia. That's what he said at a news conference in February of yesteryear, 2017, claiming, to the best of my knowledge, no person that I deal with does. Well, that was just one of the numerous times during his campaign and since that Trump insisted he had nothing or no deals or no business with motherfucking Russia. In fact, right up through June of uh, the year before yesteryear, 2016, just weeks before the Republican convention, Cohen was still pursuing talks on Trump's behalf aimed at putting a Trump Tower in Moscow. He's admitted such in court. Cohen said he lied about those talks and testimony to Congress out of loyalty to Trump, identified as person number one, like patient zero of the zombie outbreak, you know. Person number one is Trump in court documents. And on Thursday, Trump initially called Cohen a liar. But by Friday morning, he confirmed the essence of what Cohen said, tweeting that he had lightly looked at doing a building somewhere in Russia. While he ran for president, he continued to, by his own words, run my business very legal and very cool. That's per his tweet. I'm reading it verbatim. Now, whether that would have been cool with voters the year before yesteryear, back in 2016, we'll never know. Trump clearly had doubts about that at the time, since he strenuously denied then what he now admits. Whether all was legal, of course, is what's going to come out in the wash as exposing your treasonous president as not just a traitor, but a criminal. Of course, no law prevents a developer from pursuing a project in Moscow, even if he's running for president. But Cohen's negotiations included inducements for Russian President Vladimir Putin that violated U.S. laws. Moreover, Cohen's negotiations with Russian officials took place at a time that other Russian officials were hacking into Democratic Party computer systems, stealing emails and beginning to distribute them in an effort to help Trump's campaign. Now, what Trump knew, as well as others in his circle, what they all knew about those efforts remains the focus of Mueller's probe. And that's what brought Manafort back into court. Earlier this week, the special counsel's office dropped another bombshell. Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign chairman, lied to the FBI after his guilty plea. The prosecutors didn't specify what Manafort lied about at a pre-sentencing hearing today. They said, or maybe it was Friday of last week, they all tend to blend for me, especially in these wildfires. We're only now beginning to see sunlight again after the rains that followed the fires. But either Friday of last week or sometime today, I've been absorbing what news I could before presenting yourselves analysis. But at his pre-sentencing hearing, the prosecutors said they would file a detailed description next week. That much I know has either come out by now or it's going to come out on Monday. The judge presiding over Manafort's case has postponed his sentencing until early March in any event. Meantime, The Guardian has reported that Manafort met during the 2016 campaign with Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. At that time, Manafort denied it, as did WikiLeaks. But the accusation against Manafort and the plea deal with Cohen, both these came days after Trump's lawyers submitted written answers on his behalf to a list of questions Mueller has posed. That has many legal experts speculating if Mueller was just waiting to get Trump on the record before tipping his hand to prove him a liar to the face of the world. Let me tell you what Paul Manafort was lying about. It's the missing piece between Moscow and Trump. Paul Manafort was hauled back into court this week to face charges from the special counsel that he had breached his plea deal by repeatedly lying. And now the Guardian has a report that exposes something very very worth lying about. Donald Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, held secret talks with Julian Assange inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London 
visiting around the time he joined Trump's campaign. The source for the story sets Manafort's visit to Assange in March of 2016. The story that I'm sourcing from The Guardian. That puts Manafort's visit and his chairing of the Trump campaign squarely in the middle of the Russian hacking effort. This is what that period looked like when I put everything together for you today. On February 29th, Paul Manafort sent Trump a written pitch document explaining how he should direct the campaign. His pitch was backed by a recommendation from Roger Stone. The very next week, Trump senior campaign staffer Sam Clovis told the team that good U.S.-Russia relations were the goal of the campaign. They were the primary focal point of Trump's entire projected foreign policy were he to become president. Good U.S.-Russia relations, the forging of what would be known as an us-Russ condominium, a United States-Russia condominium that would aspire to take over the world by making Jerusalem the capital of a new world order and usher in the age of Antichrist. A plan first proposed to myself by Michael Aquino, who communicated that plan to Vladimir Putin through his co-religionist, Putin's Rasputin, the man proudly introduced by Alex Jones as Putin's brain, Alexander Dugin. Now, the week after all this pitch was given to Donald Trump, the week after February 29th of 2016, George Papadopoulos, fresh off here in Clovis, described the campaign's desire for an us rus condominium, a United States-Russia condominium, first met then with the London-based professor, a Russian son of a bitch, who had direct Russian connections. That was all in March of 2016. So was this. The Russians began a dedicated attempt to hack into emails of over 300 employees of the Democratic National Committee. The DCCC, I may have given too many C's there, but it's a special Democratic commission that deals with, of course, among other things, their email security, depriving them thereof. DCC, DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, is the only political committee in the country whose principal mission is to support Democratic House candidates every step of the way. So they were a prime target of Mother Russia. So the DNC, the DCCC, and the Clinton campaign itself were using two large teams of specialists. And they, in turn, were targeted by two large Russian teams of specialists that personally target each and every single one of their 300 employees at the upper echelons of the Democratic Party of the United States. The Russian teams, in tandem and in competition with each other, managed to penetrate the emails of the Clinton campaign, the chairman thereof, John Podesta, stealing 50,000 emails through what's called a phishing attack, phishing spelled with a PH. Russ hackers gained another entrance to other accounts on the campaign that same week and began sophisticated attacks on the security of servers at the Democratic National Committee. That was March of that year, the year before yesteryear. At the end of the month, two things happened. Trump met with his campaign team, where Papadopoulos discussed Russian help and the possibility of meeting with Vladimir Putin, and Paul Manafort was employed directly, hired, picked up by the Trump campaign as a front man. If Paul Manafort was meeting with Julian Assange in March of 2016, which we know was true, it betrays that every part of the Russian plan, from stealing Democratic emails to distributing them through WikiLeaks, was planned in advance. We've got a term for this. We call that phenomenon, it's a socio-political phenomenon. We call it conspiracy. And that Russian 
treasonous Republican insurgent conspiracy shows us that the campaign chair of the Trump campaign was at the dead center of that plan. Now, I want everyone to dwell on this. One key question is when the Trump campaign was aware of the Kremlin's hacking operation. What it did to encourage it would be a more important way of both phrasing it and analyzing it. Trump has repeatedly denied collusion, even though it's as evident as the nose on his face and the toupee on his bald head. The March 2016 meeting wasn't Manafort's first visit with Assange. The use of both stolen emails and social media campaigns was something Manafort relied on heavily in his actions in, guess where? Ukraine. The same Ukraine being attacked by Russia now because of the Russia investigation. Let's get back to 2016. Why did Paul Manafort lie? Of course, he didn't lie then. He lied when he was caught. He lied because it increasingly becomes evident that the origin of the plan to attack the United States through stolen emails, false media accounts, and social media pressure didn't really originate with Moscow and Vladimir Putin. It originated much closer to home with Michael Aquino's cultists, Paul Manafort, and Roger Stone. Manafort did for Trump what he did for pro-Russian forces in the Ukraine. And with the same assistance from Moscow, all manipulated by a man so disgraced in his own intelligence networks and his own military of the United States that he had to physically move, relocate himself, and pick up new citizenship in Scotland. Still part of the United Kingdom, but working on secession. That man, of course, being Michael Aquino. Yeah, if that ain't worth lying about, I don't know what is. Based on how Robert Mueller waited until Trump turned in his written responses before calling Manafort on the carpet to bring all this to bear, that's a pun, by the way, like bear rug, it's going to be interesting to see how many of his lies Trump has repeated. And that brings us to The boom factor. Where we're at now. A lot of where we're at now. Is based on WikiLeaks being a Russian front. The reality be. That the putative transparency group. Served as a connection between Moscow. And Trump's associates. That transparency group's. Own crimes are becoming clearer every day. Then-presidential candidate Donald Trump told a crowd in Kinston, North Carolina, in October of the year before yesteryear, 2016, to quote his, uh, he, uh, Donald Trump, as a Republican at this point in his life, when he started off as a Democrat back in Hillary Clinton, earlier in his campaign careers, years ago, At this point, he was, of course, a Republican running for the Russians and the Israelis. And he said, you know, they like to say every time WikiLeaks comes out, they say this is a conspiracy between Donald Trump and Russia. And the Trump held that this uh, this this fact was self-evidently ridiculous. He kept saying, give me a break. Now, barely two years later. WikiLeaks serving as a medium for Russia to boost the Trump campaign is fact and acknowledged as such. For some time, there's been substantial evidence of Russia's involvement in attempts to influence the 2016 presidential election and to hurt the Democrat Hillary Clinton's presidential bid from an elaborate trolling and astro-turfing operation to simple theft of emails and hacking. Now, until recently, the connection between those Russian efforts and Trump allies was obscured and therefore considered speculative. But all recent developments have fleshed out the operation. Russia used WikiLeaks as a conduit, and WikiLeaks, in turn, 
was in touch with Trump's allies. Now, all of this was known in total, and of course, this means it was a knowing conspiracy between WikiLeaks and Donald Trump on behalf of motherfucking Russia. Now, according to a draft document from Special Counsel Robert Mueller's team, which is investigating Russian interference in the election, the reactionary author, Jeremy Corsi, who always appeared on Coast to Coast AM every other motherfucking day to preach atomic Iran. Iran's going to take over the world. Got to have war with Iran. Iran, man. He's the same guy who wrote the book Obama Nation. Jeremy Corsi is a person who either alternatively looks like he's dying of consumption or he gets so bloated he looks like he's going to explode. Personally, I think he's a closet bitch who had a gender surgery operation and it didn't take well and the hormones don't interact well with him and sometimes see bloats with estrogen like a puffer fish. I think he's bloated now with spikes because, you know, they're coming for him. Well, this motherfucker tipped off Roger Stone, a Trump friend and former political advisor, that WikiLeaks would release a tranche of emails hacked from Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. That tip came in August of 2016, weeks before the October release. Corsi, Jeremy Corsi, author of Atomic Iran, Obama Nation, the motherfucker who goes all around preaching civil war that he's going to start, He provided the document to NBC News and then several other news organizations. As per his practice, Mueller has not commented on Corsi's behavior. According to the document, Stone, identified as person number one, putting him on a level of identification with his president, wrote to Jerome Corsi, in late July 2016, telling him to get to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Assange has been holed up for years by now, and obtain the Clinton emails that WikiLeaks had. The document states that Corsi forwarded the note to an individual identified as Ted Malak, a Trump ally who's also been interviewed by the special counsel's team. Per the document, Corsi replied to Stone in August that year, Word is, friend in embassy plans two more dumps. One shortly after I'm back. Second in October. Impact planned to be very damaging. Time to let more than Podesta be exposed as in bed with enemy if they are not already to drop HRC. That appears to be the game hackers are now about. Would not hurt to start suggesting Hillary Rodham Clinton, that's the HRC acronym, old memory bad has stroke. Neither He nor she will. I expect that much of next dump focus setting stage for Clinton Foundation debacle. See, this is where everybody got the idea that Clinton was wearing a colostomy bag that she was stroking out. And, of course, all you motherfuckers heard that on YouTube, read it on Facebook, because all the Russians told it to you. It must be motherfucking true because Russians are God. Vladimir Putin's shit tastes like chocolate. And so all you people ate that shit up, just like you did cat shit out of the litter box, saying, cat told me to, tastes good, psychedelic, I see things I don't see when I take shrooms. And look at where you're at now. So Corsi told Mueller's team he had never gotten in touch with Assange, which the document says constitutes lying to investigators. That's a crime. See, Jerome Corsi is just a criminal piece of shit. Just like the yellow nigger who was pardoned by Donald Trump, who was arrested for campaign finance crimes, Dinesh D'Souza. All these motherfuckers, doesn't matter what their color is, they're shit. Pure shit. Now, Corsi told investigators he understood Stone to be in touch with senior members of the Trump campaign. Stone's a longtime political operative. He was initially a member of the Trump presidential campaign before he departed in summer of 2015. But Stone apparently remained in touch with the Trump camp, and his friend and former business partner, Paul Manafort, served as Trump's campaign chairman during the summer of the year before yesteryear, 2016. Manafort signed a plea agreement with Mueller's team in September, 
But the special counsel said in a filing this week that Manafort has violated the agreement by continuing to lie to investigators. Russia's, of course, obviously been behind the hacks into computers at the Democratic National Committee, as well as the phishing operation, spelled with the PH, that penetrated Podesta's email account. Private sector investigators hired by the Democratic National Committee concluded that Russia was behind the 2016 hacking. Later, a report released by the Director of National Intelligence reached the same conclusion, though it was sketchy in explaining its reasoning. But July this year, an indictment from Mueller's team offered the most detailed accounting of why Russian intelligence was the culprit for the hacks, detailing how Russia passed the emails to WikiLeaks through a persona called Guccifer 2.0, G-U-C-C-I-F-E-R, named after another hacker, Guccifer a combination, of course, of Golgotha, the mountain of skulls on which Christ was crucified, and Lucifer himself. It is something which mocks not just Christ, the Messiah and Redeemer. It marks Lucifer, the fallen angel, as part of the cosmic ecosystem because both ends of that spectrum are enemies of the anti-gods. And Lucifer 2.0 meant Michael Aquino. No trial's been held for him. They'd have to extradite him from the United Kingdom as well. From his castle next door to Alistair Crowley's. Now, one important question that remains unanswered is, of course, how the Russian agents were able to hide to you, the common public, that which was so obvious to former espionage agents like myself. The fact that they were constantly in touch with WikiLeaks. Assange, of course, has long denied Russia was a source. He implied baselessly that Seth Rich, the Democratic National Convention employee, whose 2016 murder in Washington remains unsolved, he says Seth Rich was the man who was the source. If that's the case, we know why he was murdered. He would have been murdered by the Russians. Hillary Clinton would have no reason to murder him, but the Russians would. Now, Assange, of course, tries to cast doubt on the idea that Guccifer 2.0 was Russian or affiliated with the Russian government. In that sense, he's right. Guccifer 2.0 is Michael Aquino. Now, Assange undeniably has a long relationship with Russia. He shares contempt for the United States government, especially Hillary Clinton. That was indoctrinated into him by both Michael Aquino and the Kremlin. Remember, Assange is the product of an Australian cult, Shanti Naikatwan, which was a Hindu guru cult of white Australians called Shanti Naikatwan based on the concept of the friendly ones, the chosen ones, the white ones. That's why his skin is all bleached and his hair is all bleached, Michael Jackson style, to make him look albino white. They want to look more than what they are. They want to look like the people of Unterlot whom they can only ape as lower primates. And so, these Russophiliac Hindu cultists who try to base their religion on Asian Indian Vedic script because it's the original Aryan, these wannabe Aryans try to look like Nordics while they're serving the Slavs of motherfucking Russia. Now, obviously, Russia's authoritarianism and suppression of free expression should be considered at odds with WikiLeaks' stated principles. Nevertheless, Assange has viewed Russia as an important counterweight to the American empire and uh, therefore said he was willing to overlook its flaws. Now, the New York Times concluded in August of the year before yesteryear, 2016, that WikiLeaks' actions always benefited Russia and only motherfucking Russia. And Assange actually briefly hosted a show on RT, Russia Today. Most of you motherfuckers don't even know that. I know it because I speak Russian. The Kremlin-affiliated propaganda network was proud to count Julian Assange, the Nordic Aryan wannabe, as an RT host. He was on their payroll, officially an agent of propaganda for Vladimir Putin. Now, it took till Tuesday this week 
Alas, that The Guardian reported that Manafort had visited Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London in March of 2016, around the time he joined the Trump campaign. Now, Assange originally entered the Ecuadorian embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden on sex crime charges. Now, those charges were eventually dropped just due to time quotas. And since then, he's refused to leave, saying that he's worried the United States will have him arrested and extradited. Now, over the more than six years of his residency, Assange's relationship with Ecuador has obviously frayed. Ecuador has cut off his internet access late the year before yesteryear during the 2016 election, late therein too, due to his own interference, Assange's interference, in American politics. Now, more recently, Julian Assange has sued Ecuador, the very people who provide him his home, his hosts. He sued his own host for violating his rights by cutting off communications. They really ought to cut off his balls, stuff them down his throat, and make him eat him. Fuck you, Julian. Now, a recent development in the United States buttresses Assange's fears. In an apparently inadvertent disclosure in an unrelated case, a federal prosecutor wrote that Assange had been indicted under seal. The United States government said Assange's name was incorrectly spelled, or incorrectly placed, rather, in the filing. It's not yet clear what Assange might be charged with, or whether the charges would stem from Mueller's probe or something else. The more consequential questions be what, uh, of course, Trump personally ordered about the back channel to WikiLeaks. Stone, of course, Roger Stone, has repeatedly changed his story to authorities about his communications with both WikiLeaks and Trump campaign officials. Stone's also pushed the Seth Rich conspiracy theory. But while Stone was believed to be in touch with people in the Trump campaign, he had to contact the candidate himself who was absolutely aware of those communications, meaning it's a conspiracy of treason. Trump told Mueller in written answers to questions that Stone never told him about the talks with WikiLeaks. Of course, there were other channels. George Papadopoulos, the Trump campaign foreign policy aide, was told that Russia possessed emails that would be damaging to the Clinton campaign. Manafort, Donald Trump Jr., and Jared Kushner met with a Russian attorney in June of 2016 after being told that Vladimir Putin backed Trump Sr. and that they could expect dirt on Clinton. Trump also told Mueller he didn't know about that meeting, though the White House has repeatedly changed his story about it, just like everyone affiliated with him. This brings us to Argentina. Trump continues to deny any connections between his campaign and Russia. By now, there's enough evidence to treat this as seriously as anything else he says, which is to say, with the presumption that he's spewing a sewer of shit. There be not, at this point, of course, any public information that has been released to connect the president directly to Russian interference in the election. But the emerging evidence proves Trump confidants were given forewarning about Russian moves designed to hurt Clinton and boost Trump, and that WikiLeaks was the middleman that made it all possible. And that, of course, leads to the G20 summit in Argentina, Buenos Aires, the capital thereof. Trump left town just after Cohen's plea, heading for the G20 economic summit, World leaders are all performing their own delicate dances at the annual G20 meeting in Buenos Aires. The popularity of all these leaders is important to know. Both Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping outrank Donald Trump in global confidence polls. And yet, beyond even them, by light years, the most popular people of all, the moral lights to the human race at this present period in history, the Angela Merkel of United Germany and Macron of France. Merkel and Macron come out far ahead of the dictator, autocrats, Putin, Z, and Trump in a new Pew Research survey. As the moral lights of the world, particularly Angela Merkel, the leader of the free world, are such threats to the dictators, they didn't want her at the meeting. So they tried to kill her. Why? 
civil war. Where? Yemen. Yemen's become home to what the United Nations has deemed the world's worst humanitarian disaster. A nearly four-year-long civil war has left tens of thousands of Yemeni people dead and half the population on the brink of famine. As the United States Senate considers withdrawing support for Saudi Arabia and Yemen, the humanitarian crisis grows worse and more Americans and members of Congress be now aware of the brutality of the despotic Saudi regime. The Saudi government, be a dictatorship which allows no criticism, treats women as third-class citizens beneath the legal level of dogs and cats are cunts in Saudi Arabia. And Al Saud was recently responsible for the cold-blooded torture and murder of dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The United States should not be partnering in Saudi Arabia's disastrous military adventurism and its terrorist tactics. Yet it is under Donald Trump, who defends Saudi Arabia with all his breath. Since 2015, a coalition led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates attacked Yemen's Yothi rebels, and the war has expanded from there. According to the United Nations, this war has led to around 85,000 children starving to death, the most severe famine in over 100 years. Saudi bombs have destroyed Yemen's water infrastructure, leaving them unable to access clean water and leading to a cholera outbreak with over 10,000 new cases every goddamn week. Plague wars. The wars of the anti-gods. The United States has been supporting Saudi Arabia in these plague wars. The Saudi-led coalition is using bombs that proudly are labeled Made in America. Make America Great Again. The bombs have, since the Trump administration, literally been stamped by their manufacturers. Hashtag MAGA. All you motherfuckers who wear a cap with those initials ought to have one of these bombs shoved up your fucking ass. And we, the United States, are refueling Saudi planes. Our weapons are being used to kill civilians. In August, an American-made bomb with hashtag MAGA on it, proudly made in America, obliterated a school bus full of young boys, killing dozens, wounding many more, leaving them paraplegic or quadriplegic for life. With converging controversies hanging over Saudi Arabia, that nation is under siege by only one Western nation on earth. United Germany under Angela Merkel, who stated that new Verony Deutschland, new United Germany, would not sell any more weapons or technologies that could be weaponized to the House of Saud while the current dynasty remains in power. As the moral light of the world, Angela Merkel is the daughter of Adolf Hitler. In terms of moral standing, meaning she's higher than any one of you motherfucking out there who think that Vladimir Putin's fit to lick Adolf Hitler's boots. And as Hitler's spiritual daughter, The man who murdered Kosoji when he was trying to grab his marriage certificate, his license to get married, and had him tortured to death, his dick cut off and shoved in his mouth. The prince of the House of South, the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, arrived at the G20 summit. And when he got there, who met him? At the bottom of the steps laid down from his plane. After it coasted to a stop, Russian President Vladimir Putin. And when Mohammed bin Salman arrived in Buenos Aires and Russian President Vladimir Putin greeted him at the steps as basically a subordinate to the crown prince of the House of Saud, as Trump has presented himself, what did they do? Did Putin bow as Trump had done? Did Putin kiss his feet? No. They shared a high five. They did a palm slap. And they laughed. 
And they were heard to say, she's down. Now, the man who witnessed this and caused a reportedly tense moment in confronting them was France's own Emmanuel Macron. Because at that point, Emmanuel had gotten the call that Angela Merkel might not make it alive through the day. See, investigators have been looking into whether Angela Merkel's plane was tampered with. The German consular's Airbus A340 had to turn around over the Netherlands and make an emergency landing in Bonn, the old Cold War capital of West Germany, after its communication system failed. Meanwhile, Angela Merkel was forced to miss the start of the G20 summit and had to take a commercial flight from Madrid to Buenos Aires. Now, in order to prevent international incident, the NVD, the NVD being the acronym for New Verne Deutschland, the new United Germany, is blaming Merkel's plane's turnaround on electronics fault. The government of the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, the BRD, is claiming there be no evidence of criminal activity in order to prevent international incident. But the German consular's trip to the G20 in Argentina was delayed by a day. Germany's Luftwaffe, their air force, was ordered to blame an electronic fault aboard Chancellor Angela Merkel's plane for delaying her trip to the Group of 20 summit. Radio communications and fuel dumping were disrupted while the flight was over Europe, prompting the Airbus 340's pilots to turn back after less than an hour, land safely in Cologne on Thursday evening. That was confirmed by Air Force Colonel Guido Heinrich of the German Luftwaffe. Investigators were ordered to claim they found no evidence of criminal tampering. But... That press report was released through the Defense Ministry spokesman in Berlin under orders to prevent international incident. Henrik was in Cologne today saying the investigation was concluded. Cologne be where Germany's fleet of government planes is based. Henrik of the Luftwaffe said that uh, the involved parts have been replaced, the aircraft be ready to resume service as United Germany's Air Force One. Merkel, the leader of Europe's largest economy and the moral light of the world, reverted to a commercial flight from Madrid. I understand she planned to arrive in the Argentine capital this evening while I'm transmitting to yourself. That delay has clouded plans for her meeting with President Donald Trump at the summit. Though the German government spokeswoman, Martina Fietz, says the chancellor will try to reschedule all of her bilateral talks. But when she was up in the air, I can tell you what was going down. The word came out, it's urgent. The flight problems emerged near Amsterdam. The pilots couldn't dump enough fuel forcing the plane to land with a heavy load for a transatlantic flight. And yet there were almost no early signs of trouble on board the flight, aside from a frozen video screen that would normally show the plane's path. Then, as Merkel was speeding with reporters, speaking with them on the plane, just like the president does with journalists on Air Force One, about the latest tensions between Russia and the Ukraine, mind you, the door opened and a crew member asked her to come out. Now, Merkel said, why now? And the crew member replied, it's urgent. Later, Merkel would say she thought something bad had happened in Germany. But they were presented with a world of problems. Schultz remained with the reporters until Merkel returned 10 minutes later. Merkel said, the world's already full of problems. Now we have one more minor problem. The plane has a technical defect. We have to fly back. The captain announced the plane's electronic systems had failed, rendering it unable to cross the Atlantic. Now, fire trucks with blue lights waited on the runway as the plane landed 30 minutes later before taxiing to the military area of the airport. After landing at Cologne, the reporters were told they would switch to a substitute plane. 
After 30 minutes on board as firemen inspected the plane, a spokesman told reporters the replacement plane would be unable to fly to Buenos Aires because the crew had already ter- worked too many hours. They felt it would be too risky due to sleep deprivation. Now, in Argentina today, Merkel had been scheduled to meet Donald Trump, Chinese President Xi Jinping, and their Argentine host for all the world's leaders, President Mauricio Macri. She was due to arrive in time for the summit leaders' dinner tonight, while I'm transmitting to yourself. After disembarking in Europe, Merkel and her husband, Joachim Saar, finance minister Olaf Scholz, and her security officers sat for some time at a desk in the airport restaurant. Leaving shortly after midnight, she told reporters there had been a very serious problem. That was how she phrased it. So serious, she said, that she was forced to state, I'm glad we had the most experienced captain of the Deutschen Luftwaffe in command meaning the German Air Force's most experienced commander, was there to fly the plane, and if he hadn't been there, she was convinced they never would have made it home. Now, all of that, being hidden from public consumption, through my own sources in intelligence, has come to me that the Russians had hacked and destroyed the electronics of Deutschland's Luftwaffe 1, the Air Force 1, with every intent to kill Angela Merkel en route to the G20. This is war. Putin has declared war on Germany. Germany and Russia are at war. Remember that. Take everything else that happens in the Ukraine in that context. And while this war is on, who will President Trump meet with in Argentina? Who might he avoid? The center of attention there be likely to be his planned meeting tomorrow with Communist China's Xi Jinping. The dinner meeting could prove a key moment in the continuing trade war between the United States and China. Ahead of the talks with Xi, Trump has stated he won't back down on higher tariffs. And his economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, a chronic alcoholic who's been hospitalized with various liver conditions and kidney failures, has asserted China must do more. But Trump's also signaled he could be open to a deal that would de-escalate the confrontation. At least some administration officials fear the economy is heading towards a slowdown possibly a recession in 2020. They don't want Trump's policies to take the blame. What are they going to do if there's a crash? I would gloat. Now this morning, Trump met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada and Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto to sign the updated version of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Trudeau used the signing ceremony to openly showcase the tensions between the United States and Canada. Meanwhile, Peña Nieto, who was on his final day in office, could afford to be more conciliatory. Trump has a history of creating controversies at such international meetings. And we can only imagine what's going to happen when the consular of Deutschland arrives to confront him. And will there be whispers to that chicken shit son of a bitch that she didn't fall prey to he and Putin's assassination attempt to blow her right out of the skies with an electronic missile? That brings us to the showdown over the Sea of Azov because they didn't want her leadership in this moment of escalation and confrontation, where Vladimir Putin has pushed Russia-Ukraine tensions to a four-year high. 
By firing on and seizing Ukrainian vessels, Moscow has thrown the West into a quandary. Add sanctions, send in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or hope for de-escalation. Russia's violent escalation of tensions with Ukraine over access to waters near the Crimean Peninsula is potentially the most serious challenge to Kiev and the West, especially to Washington, since Russia annexed Crimea over four years ago during a different administration, a different time, a different place, a different world. The maritime showdown could spark political uncertainty in Ukraine, which on Monday voted to impose martial law for 30 days to deal with the crisis. Russia's aggressive behavior also sent the European Union, United Nations, and NATO scrambling for a response, raising the prospect of a beefed-up Western naval presence in the Black Sea and additional economic sanctions on Russia. On Sunday last week, in what was thought to be the first time the Russian military has admitted directly opening fire on its Ukrainian counterparts in four years of war, Russian ships rammed and fired on a convoy headed into the Sea of Azov, the small body of water between the Crimean Peninsula and southern Ukraine. Six Ukrainian sailors were injured, and Russia detained two gunboats and a tugboat. It was the sharpest escalation since Moscow this spring began harassing and detaining hundreds of Ukrainian ships transiting the choke point of the Kirsch Strait, which Russia controls thanks to the completion of Europe's longest bridge in May. Ukraine's foreign ministry denounced what it called Russia's provocations, stating that Moscow had crossed the red line by interfering with free navigation. Moscow, for its part, accused Kiev of provoking the incident to enable fresh Western sanctions on Russia by placing their ships in the ongoing direction of speeding Russian combat boats. Because, you know, that's the first thing you do when you see a Russian ship is throw yourself in front of it so it can ram you. Now, this could be an inflection point where things get much more violent. While Canada, the United Kingdom, and a chorus of other European countries have condemned Russia's action, the United States' response was muted under a treasonous puppet president until United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley railed against Russia at an emergency United Nations Security Council meeting on Monday of last week, stating it's an arrogant act that the international community must condemn and will never accept. But top Democratic lawmakers were irked that United States President Donald Trump had not issued a single fucking statement, nor has ever since, to my awareness. Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Issued statement on Monday, I quote as T, at this precarious time, the United States cannot afford a weak performance by President Trump at the G20, like we saw in Helsinki. Mr. President, this is your opportunity to finally show American leadership in defense of our principles and our close allies across Europe. Now, in that statement, Menendez was referring to Trump's meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, Finland, in July of this year, in which Trump sided with Putin over United States intelligence assessments on election interference, infuriating many members of Congress and national security professionals alike. Rightly so. Late Monday, the State Department released a statement expressing its deep concern over the incident, calling on Russia to return the seized vessels and crewmen and respect Ukraine's access to territorial waters. The statement was issued in the name of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who also called on both parties to exercise restraint and abide by their international obligations and commitments. It's important for the West to send a very sharp message to Russia that if you don't stop this, there will be consequences. It's a test of the West. And Washington should have responded immediately after the incident, which it has not. We're already on the back foot on this. Russia's objectives in blocking access to the Sea of Azov are multitudinous. There's several of them. And they're part of Moscow's deliberate efforts to consolidate its hold over Crimea and ring-fence much of the Black Sea, a Russian strategic obsession since the late 17th century. Now, Trump, of course, remained evasive on Crimea 
ahead of his summit with Vladimir Putin. Legal experts say the United States president has authority to recognize Crimea as part of Russia, but sanctions would remain. But by interdicting ships headed for Ukrainian ports such as Mariupol and Berdyansk, where Ukraine just started building a naval base, Russia has cost Ukraine millions of United States dollars in economic losses. In other words, they've generated millions of United States dollars in losses already at this point, with many more to come. It all further weakens southern Ukraine, and it fits Moscow's longer-term goal of destabilizing its much smaller neighbor, especially ahead of Ukraine's presidential election due in March. But of course, you dumb motherfuckers out there, you white trash who read Russian propaganda, say, oh, the Ukrainians started this because it somehow benefits their elections. That's like saying, oh, the depression should it be flash generated by Trump's insane trade war with communist China that he's instigated under orders of Vladimir Putin in order to draw communist China close into closer into Russian orbit and influence. That's like saying that that trade war, it's sparking a flare-up in American-Chinese, Sino-American confrontation militarily. If warships collide in the South China Sea, that's like saying the Chinese conspired the Donald Trump trade war in order to start trouble in the South China Sea. It's that bass backwards. It doesn't even make sense. You people got your heads so far up your fucking ass, you're high on your own fumes. Pull your head out of Vladimir Putin's ass and you might be able to take a breath of fresh oxygen. Listen to what Douglas Dietrich's saying and you might even fucking breathe for the first time in your goddamn life. Get some oxygen to your brain and start voting Democrat and calling for impeachment of Donald Trump. But instead, you're all shouting, lock her up. While the Russians move on to conquer the motherfucking world. There's a political message about the economic vulnerability of those Ukrainian ports, Mariupol and Berdyansk, on the Sea of Azov. They serve as important export terminals for the Ukraine. This operation was designed to signal to Ukraine that they're still vulnerable and there's nothing they can do about it. Longer term, Russia's angling to control a land corridor between Russia and the annexed Crimean Peninsula extending its control ultimately in Vladimir Putin's wet dreams as far west as Transnistria, the breakaway region of Moldova, where, of course, the Soviet Union in exile resides today. Now, I've written very long columns on Transnistria for those of you who want to check out my timelines. And if you were to observe, read, review those columns, you'd find out why that little strip of land on the river of the Dniester is so important to the world because the Soviet Union in exile resides there just as mine own Nationalist Republic of China has relocated to the islands of Formosa. What you... Westerners call Taiwan. Now, what would this little strip of land mean to Vladimir Putin? Why would he have such a hard-on, or why would he be so hard up that he wants a land corridor directly to this little strip of land, which serves as basically a retirement community for the old Communist Party of the Soviet Union on respirators, life support, and hospice care, in palliative facilities, so much so that Transnistria, this little Soviet outpost, the last place on earth to issue passports today, bearing the hammer and the sickle, why would Vladimir Putin care so much about these elderly retirees? So much dominating the economy with their preponderance, that Transnistria has been noted by the United Nations as having some of the best senior care on planet Earth. 
Why would anyone care? What importance do they hold? For the almighty former KGB agent Vladimir Putin, you'd think he'd want nothing to do with them. I'll tell you why. It's why he tried to kill Angela Merkel. Because, you see, between Moldova and Ukraine, Transnistria represents the Soviet Union in exile. And the Soviet Union, for those of you who remember history and have studied the First World War, was incepted by the Kaiser of the First, or rather Second Reich, the Reich of the First World War. It was the Kaiser who took Vladimir Lenin, stuck him in a boxcar, and sent him into Russia to rip apart the Tsardom of holy, sacred Mother Russia. And therefore, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin surrendered much of Russian industry, manpower, and arable land to the Second Reich of the Kaisers in return via the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. It's this treaty that Adolf Hitler wanted honored by the Soviet Union when he declared Operation Barbarossa. That land had been awarded to Germany in World War I. Hitler wanted it back, and Stalin refused to honor the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, which the Germans had won by right of armed conflict, by force majeure, a legally irreversible decision, honored by the original Bolsheviks of Vladimir Lenin. You see, all Angela Merkel has to do is assume the foreign policy position that was the Soviet Union which declared peace with both East and West Germany in 1989. See, in 1989, the Soviet Union, on the verge of bankruptcy, sold Eastern Germany to the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, capitaled in Bonn, for thinnings on the Deutschmark. And at that time, the Soviet Union had to rationalize legally its decision by stating that they declared peace with both Germanys. Now, neither East nor West Germany existed at the time of the Second World War. The Soviet Union unofficially declared peace with the Thousand Year Reich when it went off wartime and eliminated daylight saving. Today's Russian Federation remains at war with only the Axis powers of Taiwan and the Empire of Japan, which it considers as one entity, as they were in World War II. And Vladimir Putin, of course, is desperately afraid while he's at war with Asia and its leading economy in the form of the Empire of Japan that a second front will be opened by the Germans. Now, how would the Germans open this front? On legal basis of history. Angela Merkel would say, because both Germanys did not exist at the time of World War II, we have to recognize the existence of the Soviet Union, which did exist at the time. Because that Soviet Union was created in World War I by the Second Reich of Kaiser Wilhelm. And therefore, we recognize the Soviet Union as the legitimate government of all the Russias. And by recognition of the Soviet government in exile on that little strip of land along the Leicester River, of the Politburo and palliative care, as the legitimately German-recognized government of all the Russias, Vladimir Putin would be declared an illegal leader and a usurper to government by international law. He would be recognized as nothing other 
than someone who has held a coup d'etat. The dictator of a petty junta. Whereas the Germans could pump government into Transnistria in terms of financial support, they could sponsor an insurgency that would retake the Russians from Vladimir Putin, a traitor to the Communist Party. Who would support this insurgency? Former Stasi and Vopol, the intelligence and military units of the former German Democratic Republic of East Germany, the DDR. Many in the East of Germany long for the old days, days in which they wore their uniforms and were part of an order that was nostalgic to them at this point in their lives. They wore the uniforms of the failed Reich simply with communist markings. The old flared helmets you'd see the border guards wear, the Vopos of the Stasi all along the Berlin Wall. Those were manufactured in the Third Reich. Those were the last units issued or equipment issued for elite units such as the Schutzstaffler, the SS. Those were the helmets issued third phase of the Thousand Year Reich on the surface world. Those are Nazi helmets. The East Germans wore them because the communists couldn't afford to manufacture new ones. They became identified with communism, but they're national socialist. The East Germans combined these elements, and culturally, they would be the insurgency, operated out of the facade of a Deutschen-recognized Soviet exile government in Transnistria that could bring Putin's Russia to its knees. So to preempt that, Putin's attacked the Ukraine in a desperate bid to build a land bridge out of southern Ukraine, which he calls Novaya Russia or New Russia, so he could have direct physical contact with that little strip of Soviet communism, so he could have all the former elite the nomenclatura of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics put under gunfire and machine gunned to death, their life support plugs palled, and forever exterminate and annihilate the last vestiges of the Soviet Union that stands in his way from world domination. If he can't succeed in that, East German paramilitaries can be dispatched from that little strip of land outside Moldova into the Ukraine to face his forces in the field. Under Ukrainian uniforms of paramilitary volunteers, a legion condor of the new war that would fight him all the way back to the borders of the Ukraine where he had started out from. And slowly as an insurgency, bridge their way to Moscow. If the West's reaction is too weak, the contingency is to cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea and leave it a rump state. Russia is seeking to provoke Ukraine into a military response, given the overwhelming disparity between Ukraine's paltry forces and Russia's numerous naval forces in and around the Sea of Azov. It would be a way to deal Kiev a rushing blow, crush them on the high seas of the Black Sea if Ukraine takes the bait. It's clear the Ukrainian side be outflanked and outgunned by the Russian side on the seas. Putin would lose on the land against East German advisors officering Ukrainian troops based out of Transnistria with the rallying cry of a new Soviet Union recognized by United Germany. At any rate, to compensate for his losing on land, Putin's going to try and take the waters. 
Russia's already roiled Ukrainian politics just months ahead of this election in which the unpopular, as our executive producer, Pavel Edward, has stated, President Petro Poroshenko is trailing in the polls. He's an unpopular president. On Monday, the Ukrainian parliament approved Poroshenko's request for a 30-day martial law to deal with the increased threat from Russia. And Poroshenko has asserted that next year's presidential election will continue as planned, regardless. On Monday last week as well, the European Union, NATO, and the United Nations all convened separate meetings to consider how to respond to Russia's latest move. NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg condemned Russia, saying its militarization of Crimea and the Sea of Azov poses further threats to Ukraine's independence. He's called on Russia to release the Ukrainian sailors and ships it seized on Sunday last week, while European Council President Donald Tusk said that Europe will stand united in support of Ukraine. Now, there's some analysts out there urging caution. There's a Mark Galliotti, a senior non-resident fellow at Prague's Institute of uh, International Relations over there in Praha, the capital of the Czech Republic, where our executive producer was born. He asserts that neither Moscow or Kiev would look to significantly escalate the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Kiev can't really escalate it. Moscow doesn't want to escalate it. That doesn't mean a bad decision on either side can't escalate, but that's not the intent. Obviously, this man be a fool. He's exiled to Central Europe because, of course, he can't make sense of the world around him. How can Moscow not escalate a conflict that it started by escalation? The very incident is an escalation. And yet, Galiote is claiming that the building of the Kirsch Bridge from the Crimean Peninsula to Russia has been a double-edged sword for Moscow and its role in the Sea of Azov. On the one hand, it's made it easier for Russia to block off access to the body of water, as it did temporarily just uh, last weekend. But there's also a real paranoia in Moscow about the security of the bridge itself, extraordinary measures having been put in place to protect it, including a system of underwater drones to monitor for suspicious activity, and specially trained divers. And as a result, Goliote asserts, protecting the bridge has created an internal logic in Moscow to increase its maritime dominance. So he feels that it's more likely Putin's generally trying to establish that the Azov Sea be de facto Russia territorial waters. By slowly ratcheting up two steps forward, one step back, they bring it to the point where, in effect, it will be theirs. There's validity to his observations in that regard. The the self-fulfilling prophecy of the kind of motherfucker who claimed that diseases originated in ghettos where, of course, state workers were afraid to bring vaccines to. So, of course, diseases originate in places where vaccines be not available. So, too, the Russians are feeding their own paranoid delusions to the point where they have to conquer planet Earth to feel safe. Such was always the way with Mother Russia. Legally, the West be in a tricky situation when it comes to responding to Russia's actions of psychotic insanity. According to the terms of a bilateral 2003 treaty, Ukraine and Russia consider the Sea of Azov as internal waters not subject to international laws of the sea. That technically limits the ability of outside nations to send ships through the Kursk Strait and into the Sea of Azov. Yet Russia itself has violated the bilateral agreement by restricting Ukraine's assets. Ukraine has since 2016 sought international mediation in the maritime dispute, bringing a complaint against Russia before the permanent court of arbitration in the Hague. Russia's military buildup in the Sea of Azov and its efforts to restrict maritime assets be more than just saber rattling. It's a logical consequence of Moscow's insistence that the waters around Crimea be Russian, not international seas. Much as China be doing in the South China Sea, bullying smaller neighbors and claiming control of international waters in obvious violation of international law, Russia be trying to write new rules of the road. Because Russia claims to have annexed Crimea, it then claims that some of these waters be Russian territorial waters and also treats the Azov Sea as an inland sea, which be directly in contravention of international law and international norms about access to the Azov Sea. 
The Kerch Strait and the Sea of Azov don't have the economic or even strategic importance that the Baltic or the South China Sea have for international commerce, but that doesn't mean that Washington or Brussels should let Russia's behavior go unchecked. Russia's trying to establish a new norm. Once you allow a new norm to settle in, it begins incredibly hard to reverse. It sets a very dangerous maritime precedent. My father was a sailor. I'll go into this. One possible response to Russia's behavior could be a stronger NATO naval presence in the Black Sea. Beginning the year before yesteryear, 2016, NATO formally ramped up its naval posture there and in 2017 carried out a very large naval exercise. But there'd be less unity among NATO members in the Black Sea than in other contested regions such as the Baltic Sea, potentially making a concerted response more difficult. Another likely outcome of the Kirsch crisis will be renewed calls for additional economic sanctions on Russia, which could raise the costs to Russia of its foreign policy adventurism. The United States could use existing authorities to impose new sanctions on Russia without passing fresh legislation. Possible targets could be a Russian sovereign debt or a large state-owned bank. A robust response should be prepared. The United States shouldn't be too quick to pull the trigger without first giving Moscow a chance to back down. The problem with moving too fast on sanctions be that if you do it and then they back down, you're sort of obligated to remove the sanctions. The ultimate irony for Russia be that its efforts to bring Ukraine closer to Moscow in the last five years have completely backfired and likely will continue to do so in light of the pressure brought to bear by the maritime harassment. Russia wants to have a Ukraine that's more Russia-friendly, part of a greater Russian-led civilization. The fact being that they've alienated Ukraine. Ukraine now be even more pro-Western, more pro-NATO, more anti-Russian. This is a Ukraine that has never before existed in history. The source of it all, the controversial Russian bridge over the Kerch Strait, that's escalated tensions around the Crimean Peninsula. This standoff going on right now, escalating as I transmit, burn the bandwidth. What goes on between Ukraine and Russia? Russian boats, it must be remembered and never forgotten, open fire on Ukrainian ships near Crimea. I want to hammer this through your heads, because I keep hearing dumb motherfuckers high on cat shit they dig out of the litter box saying... That somehow this is a Ukrainian provocation. So they can slam Marshall Daw down people's throats before elections. Again, that's so bass backwards. You people shouldn't be fucking driving. The Russians opened fire on Ukrainian ships near Crimea. They seized three of them in the Kyrgyz Strait. There's no way the Ukrainians could have provoked this. Anyone who tells you they have, you tell them, eat shit and die. The Kyrgyz Strait is a key waterway of strategic interest to both Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainian lawmakers declared martial law in direct response. The United Nations Security Council held an emergency meeting because the Kyrgyz Strait be a vital economic lifeline for Ukraine. Now, I'm reminded, of course, by uh, Pavel Edward, our uh, executive producer, that the Russians themselves claim it was a Ukrainian provocation. So anyone who regurgitates that claim, all you are is a parrot on Putin's shoulder. You're a Russian mockingbird. And let anyone who, re who claims that let them know it. Ram it down their throats. Don't even do it to try to wake them up. These people are zombies. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Just do it to make them feel bad. <laughs> That's what you need to do it for. It's at that point now. This is how the Republicans feel about Trump being president. They don't care that everything he does is wrong. They don't care he's a rapist. They don't care he's a traitor. All they care about is that he makes good, real, decent Americans sick. Literally physically sick with stress. I'll go into the psychiatric effects of Donald Trump at some point in the near future. He's...
created syndromes identified by psychiatrists at this point concerning his impact on mental health across the United States. That's what makes Republicans happy. So it's your turn to make these Russian insurgents, the red Republicans, unhappy and sick by exposing truth to them. And no other reason be behind it than that satisfaction. So in terms of the Kursk Strait as an economic lifeline for Ukraine, it allows ships leaving the port city of Mariupol to access the Black Sea. It's also the closest point of access for Russia to Crimea, a peninsula Moscow has forcibly annexed with much controversy worldwide in 2014 when diseases like flaccid myelitis began to appear in the United States, resultant Russian testing, the precursor to the release of massive biological weapons terrorism by motherfucking Russia come 2020 that Donald Trump can declare martial law and make himself president for life like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. But when we go back to last weekend, precursor to all this, when you get these three Ukrainian naval ships traveling from Odessa on the coast of the Black Sea to Mariupol on the coast of the Sea of Azov, when the Russian Coast Guard opened fire and seized those vessels, Ukraine confirmed three sailors were, at the very least, three of them were injured in the incident. Since then, it's been increased in terms of the number that were counted. Russia at that time said it was also three. According to Kiev, Russia's actions violated the 2003 treaty that gave both nations access to the Sea of Azov and the Kursk Strait, where the ships were intercepted. Uh, and Russia, of course, claimed that the vessels were maneuvering dangerously and needed to be stopped meaning they were bringing home supplies and, of course, being a, a viable part of Ukrainian trade. Now, I want to thank Zoe Brendan. Hugs to Zoe Brendan. Uh, shout out to Zoe Brendan, who has uh, relayed to me that uh, Bush Sr. has died. And uh, that is uh, what I'll call breaking news in the midst of my report. So uh, let's back, back to analysis. The Kursk Strait is this narrow passageway between the eastern tip of Crimea and the Russian mainland to access the Sea of Azov, on which two critical Ukrainian ports be located. Vessels need, per force of circumstance, to pass through this waterway. They don't have a choice. But both Ukraine and Russia have a right by treaty to patrol this area, Russia began construction of a controversial bridge connecting the Crimean Peninsula, which it annexed by force in violation of all international law in 2014, an act of war. And they've linked that peninsula to the Russian mainland via the Kursk Strait. The bridge spans 12 miles. That's 19 kilometers. It was opened only six months ago at just 33 meters high. That's 108 feet in the air. It's restricted access to the Sea of Azov for larger Ukrainian ships, like trade ships, merchant ships. They can't pass through. That eliminates large supplies or trade to the Ukraine. It was built for specifically this reason, to act as an obstacle to Ukrainian trade and begin to suffocate it, like slowly choking oxygen off from a woman that you're raping so that you can enjoy the vibrations of her vagina while she convulses before you finally ejaculate and then complete her murder. That's how these guys get off. That's how these guys got off when I saw footage in the Presidio of snuff films made by killing children that was shown in the library with permission of my operations manager to library clientele for their amusement when I worked as a Department of Defense librarian. None of this could be reported to civilian police officers because civilians had no jurisdiction over federal, let alone military property. The Presidio Military Base. Now, with this choking, 
of the victim. Indeed, Kiev and Washington have pointed to, out to the Russians that they see the bridge as an obstacle to block maritime traffic and further destabilize Ukraine before it can develop and stabilize its economy. Now, according to Radio Free Europe, of course, which now serves on the side of the enemy, this latest incident be just another indication that neither side be willing to back down. How far can it go? It's already escalated to the point where Ukraine has banned all Russian men. After Russia seized those Ukrainian army ships in the Kyr Strait on Sunday last week, Ukraine declared martial law in border regions with its powerful Russian neighbor and citing fears of invasion by ununiformed paramilitary insurgents, militiamen. Ukraine has banned all Russian men ages 16 through 60 years of age from entering Ukraine. This ban might trigger reciprocal measures from Russia. The European Union has seen renewal of sanctions on Russia. That's their parallel to the Ukraine barring entry to Russian men of combat age. Anyone between the ages of 16 to 60 is a potential combatant if they're a member of the male gender. Now, this move was introduced under martial law and uh, it was announced by a senior state security official in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And, of course, it's all based on the Black Sea incident United States President Donald Trump had called off his meeting at the time that this measure was put in effect. He had called off his meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin in Argentina. That was to signal Washington's disapproval of Russian behavior in the naval clash with the Ukraine. This was done under force of circumstances. President Trump did not want to do this. Nevertheless, being forced to do it, his move was applauded in Kiev the capital of Ukraine. The Russian ruble, which be sensitive to events that might lead to new sanctions being imposed on Russia, fell on news of this cancelled meeting. Moscow admitted it had expected the leaders to have an impromptu meet that Vladimir Putin's puppet might receive his direct orders from his handler, President Putin himself. And in a further boost to Ukraine, the European Union released 500 million euros in financial assistance to Kiev, and European President Donald Tusk, not Donald Trump, but Donald Tusk over there in Europe, predicted that Brussels, the capital of the European Union, would roll over sanctions on Russia at a summit this coming December 13th through the 14th. Now, President Petro Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, referred to Russia's seizure and subsequent annexation of Crimea in 2014 and Russia's support for separatist uprisings in eastern Ukraine. He referred the, to these phenomena when he spoke of banning Russian men, asserting, of course, the fact that this be important for preempting a full-scale Russian invasion. He factually asserted that these measures were absolutely necessary to block the Russian Federation from forming detachments of private armies within the borders of Ukraine itself, which would be, in fact be representatives of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. It would preempt them from carrying out the operations that they had tried to conduct back in 2014 when they were unleashing the acute, flaccid, my, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the name of the disease, the AFM, uh, in the United States. And, of course, that was a time when the United States was barely even aware of Russia's planned campaign to put their man, Donald Trump, in as president. 
Now in Moscow, of course, the Russians said they had no plans for reciprocal movements to bar Ukrainian men because they're not concerned about a Ukrainian insurgency. They're concerned about an East German insurgency under auspices of the Soviet government in exile. Hence the reasons for the maritime and choke-off attacks. Now, the European Union has propped up Ukraine's war scarred economy since the Crimea annexation while prodding pro-Western authorities to pass reforms and tackle corruption. So, maybe this is an opportunity through the European Commission decision on disbursement to the Ukraine and its people while they face new aggression from Russia to see op- a solidarity from international partners in Europe. The G7 group of nations has also weighed in on Ukraine's behalf, blaming Moscow's actions that have dangerously raised tensions, as well they should have, in terms of backing Ukraine. And, of course, Russia has moved the 24 sailors that it's taken prisoner to prisons in Moscow, to the infamous Lubyanka Jal, where three of them are being treated in a prison hospital. Now, we have a situation in which a senior ally of German Chancellor Angela Merkel has confirmed that the European Union and the United States should consider banning from their ports Russian ships originating from the Azov Sea as a tit-for-tat measure. This is one of the reasons Vladimir Putin conspired with the Prince of the House of Saud who can no longer receive weapon shipments from United Germany to assassinate Angela Merkel. Russia says it will deploy a new division of Panzer medium-range surface-to-air systems comprising between 12 and 18 military vehicles on the Crimean Peninsula by the end of the year. The planned deployment comes after Russia announced it had deployed a new battalion of advanced S-400 surface-to-air missile systems. It's fourth such battalion to the peninsula's north. A Crimean security source was also quoted by Interfax on Thursday, saying that Russia planned to build a new missile early warning radar station in Crimea next year, which, of course, will be upon us in a matter of a little over 30 days. Now, again... All of this mobilization on Russia's part renders beyond ridiculous and truly offensive Russian officials accusing Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, of artificially manufacturing this crisis to prop up sagging ratings ahead of this election next March. Instead, of course, the Russians have suffered by their own actions, renewed calls for more Western sanctions on Russia. The president of the European Union, Donald Tusk, will chair an EU summit December 13th through the 14th. Due to roll over for another year, the bloc's measures against Russia's defense, energy, and banking sectors. Europe is united in support to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. That's why I, myself, am sure that the European Union will roll over the sanctions against Russia this month in December, this year early. So far, that's been confirmed by Donald Tusk himself at a news conference in Argentina. The United States and the European Union have imposed sanctions on Russia since 2014, when Moscow had annexed Crimea after a pro-Russian leader was toppled in Kiev. And the fighting between Ukraine and Moscow-backed separatists has killed over 10,000 people since that time. Major fighting ended with a 2015 ceasefire, but deadly exchanges of fire are still frequent. And now we have martial law in force in regions bordering Russia, including Donetsk, near the front line with the rebels. And that's why the need to bar any Russian man aged between 16 and 60 into the nation. Now, I want to be clear about this. Poroshenko, the unpopular president of the Ukraine, 
has confirmed that he will make exceptions for humanitarian cases. He will allow Russian men into the nation between the ages of 16 to 60 who are traveling to funerals. Now, of course, the martial law has been imposed in 10 Ukrainian regions until the day after Christmas, December 26. And, of course, we have a situation where the Ukrainians are in the right considering every measure that they've taken. The Russian tanks, the number of Russian tanks at bases located along the Ukrainian border have grown three times. They've tripled with a threat of full-scale war over the past several weeks and months. Five of the ten regions under martial law bordering Russia also include two that are adjacent to Moldova's breakaway Transnistria region, where, of course, to prevent East German troops or preempt East German troops from infiltrating, Russian troops have been stationed. So they've actually invaded the Soviet Union in exile in an attempt to preempt the Merkel option of Soviet exile government recognition as the legitimate government of all the Russias. The other three regions under martial law border the Black Sea or Sea of Azov close to Crimea. The ban could have a devastating impact on cross-border travel when they don't allow men between the ages of 16 and 60 of Russian ethnicity into the Ukraine as the holiday period approaches. Many Russians have relatives living in Ukraine. Reacting to the Ukrainian ban, of course, the Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova has said that uh, Moscow's mirroring such measures would only result in full madness. That's because, of course, they realize the Ukraines are not the belligerents here. They're not the aggressors. That alone prompts that level of confidence on behalf of motherfucking Russia. So, to clarify for all of you, I'm a Christian of the Eastern Byzantine Orthodox Rite Liturgy, meaning I'm a member of the Orthodox Church of Byzantium. These are the churches of the East, the churches of Russia, Serbia, Moldova, Ukraine, Bulgaria, the predominantly Slavic areas, and also of Greece. And, of course, you have a monastery that the Russians were using for the shipment of weapons and as a source for exacerbating Kiev-Moscow tensions using Russian clergy. So, in response to the weaponization of the church, by motherfucking Russia. The Ukrainians are policing with stricter checks at border crossings. Although the ban applies to all points of entry into Ukraine, the main focus is likely to be on the nearly 2,000 kilometers, that would be about 1,243 miles, of the Ukrainian-Russian land border. Soon after the conflict began, in 2014, the Ukrainians started building a wall, a system of fortifications along that border. Unfortunately, that project is still unfinished due to a lack of funds. To further complicate the matter, hundreds of kilometers of Ukraine's border are de facto controlled by Russia and pro-Russian separatists in the east, a true invasion. With new, no direct flights between Ukraine and Russia, Kiev-Moscow trains have become popular. Meanwhile, checkpoints have been set up between Ukraine and Russian annex Crimea in the south and also on the line of separation between Ukraine and two self-proclaimed rebel republics in the east. All of the train traffic now will be bearing nothing but Russian women into the country. I think I could live with that personally. <laughs> and even before Friday's ban, 
Ukraine had already put restrictions on Russian nationals wanting to visit in general. A number of them have been deported for failing to explain the purpose of their visit. A lot of them were going to the churches that became weapon shipping points for Russian militias within Ukraine. These were conducting crimes similar to mass shootings in the United States. So the Russian nationals, as well as other foreigners, are routinely denied entry into Ukraine if they visited Crimea or any of the self-proclaimed republics not via Ukrainian-controlled points of entry. And Kiev has also stopped direct flights between Ukraine and Russia. But what about the captured Ukrainian sailors? At least three of the 24 Ukrainians were injured when the Russian Coast Guard and Special Forces, this was Spatsnats, mind you, the elite, who boarded their vessels and attacked them last Sunday. This is obviously directly under orders of Vladimir Putin. The goddamn Coast Guard of the United States does not carry Delta Force troopers on their rescue boats, okay? So, too, the Russian Coast Guard wouldn't be carrying no motherfucking Spatsnats unless this were a directly ordered operation under observation of Vladimir Putin himself. You know, as a military expert, this is what makes me sick when I talk to you civilians and you buy into propaganda of the enemy in the midst of wartime when they're trying to assassinate the leader of the free world, Angela Merkel. God damn you to hell eternal. How can you be so fucking stupid? You deserve to die just out of Darwinian selection, just so we can chlorinate the gene pool. Bleach it. Of your trash genes. At any rate, a Russian court in Crimea, a kangaroo court in an illegal nation state recognized only by the Russian Federation, that court ordered the Ukrainian sailors to be detained for at least 60 days, despite international outcry. The sailors are accused of illegally crossing into Russia, and yet Russia is not treating them as prisoners of war, which is an interesting sign of fear. So on Friday, Crimea's human rights ombudsman, Yudmila Lubina, said the captured servicemen had been transferred from Crimea to Moscow to rot in, of course, the world-infamous Lubyanka jail. But why would a Ukraine-Russia sea clash be fraught with risk? The combat sailor experience of my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, comes into play here. In terms of uh, the media expert of uh, Ukraine itself, I believe uh, there's a commander in the Ukrainian Navy that I saw on Ukrainian state television talking about the tensions in the Azov Sea, asserting forcefully that this won't be another Kraina, that uh, Commander Ihor Vorochenko said that Ukraine would fight to the death if conflict were to go all out. But despite Commander Ihor Vorochenko's bravado, it's clear that Russia holds all the cards. The Ukrainians are outnumbered and outgunned on the water. There's very little Ukraine's threadbare navy could do if Russia wanted to take total control of the Sea of Azov. Now, the Russians are arguing that legally Ukraine's position also be weak because under the terms of the 2003 agreement, the Azov Sea and its access point through the Kursk Strait are supposed to be shared by Ukraine and Russia. That 2003 deal never put any dotted lines on the chart. Instead, the vessels of both nations were given carte blanche to pretty much roam as they wished. And it worked up to a point. Then in 2014, Russia invaded Crimea. And, of course, the dynamic changed. The Kersh Strait was no longer flanked by Russian authorities to the east and the Ukrainians to the west. The straits were now fully under Moscow's control. And the motherfucking Russians had big, big plans. Moscow wanted to link Crimea to Russia, so this 19-kilometer, this 12-mile bridge was quickly constructed, formally opened in May this year, when Russian President Vladimir Putin triumphantly drove a truck across it, 
The bridge was very bad news for East Ukraine. Citing the need to increase security, Russia dramatically increased the number of armed vessels both near the Kerch Strait and in the Sea of Azov, creating a need for the security that they could mobilize invasion forces. The cargo ships that wanted to reach Ukraine's Azov ports now found themselves subject to Russian inspection and lengthy delays that sometimes stretched to a week so that whatever food they brought in was rotted and inedible, starving the Ukrainian people out. With an extra day at sea costing a shipping company up to 11,700 pounds sterling, or about 15,000 United States dollars a day, picking up steel or grain from Mario Pole was now an unpredictable proposition. And many potential investors, understandably, opted to stay away. So Ukraine was facing an economic blockade. Russia was obviously in breach of the 2003 sharing agreement. But much to Kiev's frustration, there was little international response, and the life was slowly throttled out of Ukraine's Azov ports, rendering them ghost towns. The cranes that peered down onto Mariupol's docks, stood idle, on the, and the port workers were put on a four-day work week. When I saw footage from October of last year, mind you, there were only three cargo ships in dock. I can't imagine how empty these ghost ports must be today. So left to their own devices, Ukraine's tried valiantly to bolster its limited naval capabilities. Russia's President Vladimir Putin, before going to the G20 summit in Buenos Aires, Argentina, visited Crimea. He visited Crimea to take personal command of the operation. He was there before the clash a few miles off the peninsula. He was personally cited by many people, eyewitnesses, as being there 48 hours before the clash. Obviously there to personally direct the incident. Again, with this kind of evidence admitted to by Vladimir Putin himself that he was there. 48 hours before the incident. How could any motherfucker claim the Ukrainians provoked this? You truly are out of your goddamn minds if you buy into these Russian-sponsored conspiracy theories. Fake news. Disinformatia. Now, in counteraction, the Ukrainians have taken to refitting Two second-hand ships, hand-me-downs from the United States. A few vessels have been redeployed from the Black Sea into the Azov. But they're all still hopelessly outnumbered. Again, going back to Sunday when the Ukraine attempted to send three naval vessels, a tugboat and two small armored ships through the Kursk Strait, those dramatic events have been well documented. And as is now the case with everything to do with motherfucking Russia, endlessly debated by Russia's red Republican insurgents or their alternative right paramilitaries and traitors all over the Western world from Europe to South Africa. Put in its simplest uncontestable terms, Russia Coast Guard vessels rammed and then shot at the Ukrainian boats before capturing them with Sputznot Special Forces all 24 sailors on board, the most serious development in Ukraine's relationship with Russia since the annexation of Krim back in 2014. All about this place that's rather difficult to get into. Now, of course, Naval Commander Voroshenko says Ukraine will fight for their land and their waters till their last breath. We'll do all we can so our land remains ours and our sea remains ours. We'll take all necessary measures to defend and protect our country. He's got to do what he's got to do. What is it that Vladimir Putin is doing? Aside from everything else that I've explained to you, all my father's years at sea made himself, per force of circumstances, what he jokingly used to refer to himself as a bunkroll lawyer, meaning he had to become aware of maritime rules and regulations. 
the laws of the sea. Imposing control of the Kursk Strait helps Vladimir Putin and his government chip away at the United States-led legal order of the high seas. Russia's provocations in the Kursk Strait aren't just a challenge to Ukraine. Like Beijing in the South China Sea, Moscow is seeking to undermine international maritime law. Sunday's encounter between Russia and Ukrainian vessels in the Kursk Strait the entryway to the Sea of Azov east of the Crimean Peninsula revived an age-old question in international politics. Can a coastal nation own the sea? International law says no. Authoritarian states such as China and Russia say yes. Which view prevails may depend on whether seafaring societies band together and push back effectively against Moscow and Beijing, the Sino-Slavic synaxis, of convenience and aggression. When Russian ships detained those two Ukrainian gunboats and a tugboat after an exchange of fire and after Russians deliberately rammed the tugboat, as of my speaking to you, we have a Russian judge in an illegal court of law not recognized by the world in a militarily occupied portion of a sovereign nation state, the Crimean Peninsula, an ethnic Russian judge has ordered 12 of the 24 captured Ukrainian mariners of an entirely different nationality from his own to be held until trial in late January of next year. This be the culmination of an increasingly provocative Russian policy. In recent months, Moscow has taken to treating the Kursk Strait as a border checkpoint, a point of entry to sovereign Russian territory. Guards demand that Ukrainian ships request permission before transiting the strait. Ukraine rejects Russia's right to regulate passage through the sole gateway to Ukraine's southeasterly sea coast. Moscow's up the states because it can. Russia annexed Krim in 2014, granted Russian border guards physical control of both sides of the strait. The new policy flouts the 2003 bilateral agreement designating the Kursk Strait and Sea of Azov, historically internal waters of the Russian Federation and the Ukraine. That pact guarantees ships fly in their flags of either nation state free navigation through those seaways. The two governments further pledged to negotiate a boundary between waters they control. They never did because Russia refused to send representatives to any meetings dedicated to that purpose. So my analysis of the recent conflict at sea takes into account many other people's analyses that make much of how it relates to the shadowy land war in eastern Ukraine, which I've already articulated to you in depth. Barricading the Kursk Strait makes the Sea of Azov a Russian lake. The Russian Navy can use the sea while the Ukrainian naval forces cannot. In other words, Russia's Navy now has the luxury of projecting power ashore, coastal bombardment, or running in supplies from that safe haven, inserting Spetsnaz Special Forces troops, while barring Ukraine from doing the same, a time-honored strategy of stronger naval powers. The United States-led coalition made short work of Saddam Hussein's Navy in 1991, sinking most of the Iraqi fleet, bottling up the remnants in port, allowed the coalition to bring in supplies in bulk by sea and pummel Iraqi targets with missile and airstrikes from offshore. I know because I was in Operation Desert Storm. I was in the Marine Corps, which, of course, is simply the infantry of the United States Navy, which sank the Iraqi Navy. I speak of this from firsthand experience. The Russians are doing this now without the shipwrecks to create material presence of their aggression. This be a maritime flanking movement of considerable import for both combatants. Ukraine finds itself geographically and diplomatically isolated, the best of all worlds for a bigger power like Russia intent on bullying a smaller one. Might now makes right in the Sea of Azov, and might favors Russia very lopsidedly. 
And Moscow has more ambitious goals to build upon. By imposing control of the strait, this helps President Vladimir Putin and his government chip away at the United States legal overseas, just as his ally, President Xi Jinping's communist China, has eroded navigational freedoms in the South China Sea. Both Beijing and Moscow covet the right and power to dictate what happens in offshore waters. They have resorted to armed force to buttress their extra-legal claims and are not counting on competitors to be unable or unwilling to contest those claims effectively. China manufactures arms and fortifies artificial islands to uphold its maritime claims. Russia is leveraging its control of a vital strait. Given time and sufficient physical strength, the Sino-Slavic Synaxis, the Chinese-Russian Entente, may rewrite the rules governing seaborne endeavors in both Southeast Asia and the Black Sea Basin. They could forbid surveillance flights, naval flight operations, underwater surveys, and a host of other activities permitted under the law of the sea, the international law of the sea. That would leave Western forces unfamiliar with potential battlegrounds, and thus at a marked disadvantage in future conflicts, wars that Russia and China both intend to start. Take the South China Sea. I was born in Taiwan. I know of what I speak. The PLA, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, has erected what the United States Pacific Command boss, Admiral Phil Davidson, terms a Great Wall of SAMs, surface-to-air missiles, referencing those missiles now deployed on islands and atolls, built out of nothing, artificially, by the Chinese that dot the sea. Russia can do China one better. The South China Sea is a vast expanse where many coastal and seagoing states have a stake in maritime freedom. The Sea of Azov, by contrast, is a compact theater cut off geographically from the larger Black Sea. It's also a theater where both parties to the quarrel agree they're the only two stakeholders. Geography, physical might, and diplomacy render it virtually impossible for NATO and other outsiders to intercede on Kiev's behalf. Ja I the only way to fight back is by Germany sending in Eastern Stoppers to overthrow the Russian occupation of the Soviet Union in exile and make that the legally recognized government that they can use as a facade for German insurgents into motherfucking Russia to stabilize the Ukrainian front, bring Ukraine back its independence. Now, unlike the broader Black Sea, outside of the theater of land, which I've articulated, NATO members in the wider Black Sea region, namely Turkey, are players and potential opponents for Russia and access for all navies through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits is regulated by the 1936 Montreux Convention. There be no such regime for the Sea of Azov, an inland sea of the Black Sea. Over the longer term, Russia can hope to browbeat Ukraine into acceding to its de facto sovereignty over the Sea of Azov, just as China has evidently cowed the Philippines and its petty dictator, the dog Duterte, into surrendering all of their possessions to communist China. And, of course, China, just as it cowed the Philippines into being its lap bitch, its whip dog, is attempting to cow Vietnam and other maritime claimants, including my native, true homeland and heartland, the Nationalist Republic of China, as relocated to Taiwan. China wants to cow all of these maritime powers into tacitly accepting its possession of reefs and atolls such as Scarborough Shoal and Mischief Reef. China's Navy and Coast Guard ensconce themselves on islands and atolls and dare outmatched opponents to dislodge them. This is happening despite a 2016 international court ruling pronouncing China's seizure of features within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone is unlawful. An international legal victory for the Philippines was given away by Duterte, who pulled his ass cheeks apart and told Xi Jinping, fuck me here. He gave all the islands awarded to the Philippines by the United Nations to communist China outright and free. Because Duterte ain't no dirty Harry. Duterte's nothing but a bitch. Just like Donald Trump. 
That's why when those two got together, it looked like fucking lap dance. I've seen homosexual couples in San Francisco with more restraint. Sovereignty is at the heart of all these controversies. Students learn in International Relations 101 that I took when I majored in political ideology at San Francisco State University. During my two semesters there to earn my baccalaureate, Sovereignty means a monopoly on the legitimate use of force within certain lines on the map we call borders. The government welding the monopoly of force makes laws and regulations, and others obey. Under the traditional understanding of maritime law, as codified in the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, sovereignty applies only to dry land and to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea or strip of sea immediately offshore. Neither China nor Russia accepts that land-bound doctrine. Those two aggressor nations think they can redefine water as national territory to recreate themselves as waterborne maritime empires. If they get their way, lawmakers in Beijing and Moscow will make the rules stipulating what navies and merchant fleets may do there. They'll restrict military activities in particular. Beijing aspires to enforce indisputable sovereignty within a nine-dash line it has sketched on the map enclosing all the South China Sea, inclusive of islands directly within the territory of sovereign nation-states or empires such as Indonesia. Beijing bases its claims to nautical sovereignty on the notion that Chinese seafarers made use of the South China Sea's waters since time immemorial. The United Nations Convention expressly forbids such historical claims. Moscow is attempting to do something similar within the solid rim that encases the Sea of Azov. If strong coastal states make unlawful claims and no one reverses them, they will redefine freedom of the sea out of existence itself and repeal the law of the sea of the nations of the world in any areas where they brandish superior military might. Instead of international law or rule of law, might makes right, won't just rule on land. It'll rule whoever can claim as much of the seas that they can sail. These controversies are but the latest round in an ancient and my late and sainted father thought settled argument over freedom of the sea. Back in the 17th century, the father of international law, the Dutchman, Hugo Grotius, surname spelled G-R-O-T-I-U-S, and the English jurist, John Selden, surname spelled S-E-L-D-E-N, debated whether coastal states could own the sea. Grotius said no, so said the Dutchman. Selden, an emphatic yes, so said the Englishman, because he was part of a phallusocracy, a maritime empire. Grotius published a treatise titled Mer Liberum in 1609. I'm sorry, did I mispronounce that? Did I signify that with my Chinese accent? Thassalocracy. Thassalocracy. Maritime empire. Like the ancient Greeks or Phoenicians. You can look it up if you can spell it. But in terms of definition of coastal states and their rights, the Dutchman Grotius published a treatise titled Mare Liberum. That is, of course... Seas of Liberty. He published that book in 1609, arguing that the sea be no one's property. It is a mostly ungoverned expanse that belongs to everyone and no one. No coastal state acts as lawgiver. Not so, insisted Selden, the Englishman. That British scholar issued a belated rejoinder in 1635. It took him decades to write his anti-book, The Mare Clausum. The seas of clause, meaning as in legal clausation, insisting that the English crown was sovereign over the seas lapping against the British Isles. Geographic position coupled with naval power entitled London to control the approaches to northwestern Europe, inclusive Grotius' own Nederlands. In Selden's view, English rulers made the laws governing merchant and naval shipping, and fellow European rulers 
were bound to obey the perfidious English, the Albions. Now, under Selden's Albionese doctrine of the closed sea, oceans and seas belonged to whichever sovereign boasted a navy strong enough to crush rival claimants. Now, until recently, Grotius the Dutchman appeared to have won out. The framers of the United Nations Convention codified his idea of the open sea, sharply circumscribing coastal states' authority beyond their territorial seas. But Russia and China be bent on gradually, almost imperceptibly, resuscitating the British, the Anglian, the Anglo-Saxon white supremacist closed sea doctrine. The slow pace of change makes it hard for allies to summon the sense of urgency that propels multinational undertakings. If Moscow and Beijing succeed in the Sea of Azov and South China Seas, they will have abridged the legal order premised on free use of the sea, and they will damage the United States' geopolitical standing in the process as a maritime empire across the seas of planet Earth, which should properly be named Planet Ocean, as 75% of our service and beyond of the surface world be seawater. If Moscow and Beijing succeed in the Sea of Azov and South China Seas, they will have abridged the legal order premised on free use of the sea, meaning that they could conquer any ocean on Earth and claim it their own, and no one would be allowed to sail their waters. They would claim the salt of the surface world and damage the United States' geopolitical standing in the process. During World War II, the Yale geopolitical scholar Nicholas Spikeman, surname spelled like spy, S-P-Y-K-M-A-N, Spikeman pointed out that the Great Britain could assemble and rule a liberal maritime empire because its Royal Navy commanded the marginal seas, abutting the Eurasian periphery. In other words, British seafarers, soldiers, and diplomats enjoyed ready access to the continental landmass from the Baltic Sea, Persian Gulf, South China Sea, and other peripheral seas. They could radiate power inland at will to advance British interests. While the United States doesn't admit to ruling an empire, though it should, it was the original prototype for the alternative right, conspiracy mongers, and white supremacists, James Patrick Buchanan, or Patrick James Buchanan being his proper name. He, of course, claimed the United States be a republic and not an empire. He wrote a book with that title, and a republic and not an empire. The United States of America is an empire. This is an American empire. When we see the United States become a full democracy, we will be able to take pride in being a democratic empire, but an empire nonetheless. The United States as an empire, unlike the Britons, who surrounded Eurasia with bases and ports, has no strategic position in the coastal regions of Western Europe, East Asia, or South Asia without guaranteed access to allies in the marginal seas. Take away access to bases provided by the good graces of former fascist Italy, today's Imperial Japan, or even minuscule Bahrain among the trucial sheikdoms of the Persian Gulf, and the United States Navy and fellow armed services must fall back. Spikeman's logic thus holds in this post-imperial world. In the end, the Black Sea and South China Sea disputes aren't just about the legal order, they're about geopolitical power and influence. If aggressors get their way in local disputes, they'll stage further challenges in hopes of winning a seismic victory over time. As the Sino-Slavic Synaxis, the axis of convenience, Russia and China seek to extend their legal jurisdiction and military control. Engineering works have become a major weapon in their arsenals. People's Liberation Army combat engineers built mischief reef from a mostly submerged atoll into a military installation by 1998, while the United States and its allies were embroiled in Balkan wars that I myself fought in as a mercenary and other controversies, paying little attention to Southeast Asia. That set a bad precedent.
Beijing followed up starting in 2013, giving rise to today's network of island fortresses that threaten any Navy or Coast Guard that cares to oppose Chinese claims to sovereignty. That applies not just to United States Navy and Southeast Asian navies and Coast Guards, but to the Royal Australian Navy and Indian Navy as well. For their part, Russian engineers constructed a bridge spanning the Kursk Strait after Russia annexed Crimea. Visually speaking, the bridge completes the southern rim of the Sea of Azov, closes it in with an obstacle that's like a trip line, a trip line that cuts people off at the knees or at the throat, trying to break out of a chokehold. It constitutes a barrier to nautical movement in more than any metaphorical sense. The main span of the Cursed Bridge is just 108 fucking feet high, capping the height and thus the size and capacity of any merchant and military vehicles that hope to pass beneath. A public infrastructure project has, in effect, disrupted Ukraine's logistics and constrained its combat power off its own coast. In October of 1939, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill depicted Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Now to all you fools out there listening to that fool, it remaineth so. But in that BBC, that British Broadcasting Company broadcast, Churchill hastened to add, perhaps there'd be a key. That key be Russian national interest. The national interest in Putin's eyes be regaining control of geographic space adjoining Russian frontiers. Moscow considers maritime space part of that effort. And its interest in seaborne affairs be nothing new. In 1988, for instance, the Soviet Navy dispatched a vessel to deliberately, albeit delicately, collide with a United States Navy cruiser passing within Soviet territorial waters in the Black Sea. The Black Sea bumping incident expressed Soviet leaders' displeasure with Western naval operations too close to home. As Churchill prophesied, Moscow has pursued strategic interests with admirable consistency. Yet it dependably deploys unpredictable methods and tactics to advance its strategic quest. Moscow has pursued strategic interests that have taken into account unconventional and cybernetic fronts of combat. Indeed, the Kremlin has dusted off its Cold War playbook and advanced upon it with new chapters. Soviet strategy sought to layer these offshore waters and the skies above into a blue belt of defense or a buffer zone against Western naval operations. Under Vladimir Putin, a latter-day blue belt is in the offing. To combat Russia's low-level aggression and low-intensity combat, the United States and its allies must first admit they have a problem. Freedom of the sea be indivisible. If Russia makes itself the de facto sovereign of the Sea of Azov, future moves in its incremental strategy will soon follow. Its strategy will imperil the broader Black Sea and eventually the Eastern Mediterranean Sea and the Baltic Sea. Second, fashion a Hippocratic strategy. Do no harm. Reversing Russian gains in the Sea of Azov may prove impractical for the United States and its allies. But Western diplomats must do nothing to abet Russian strategy. At the same time, they must go out of their way early and oft to state that no coastal state may modify the law of the sea by fiat. It will be far easier for the West to contest the wider Black Sea and other peripheral waters than the Sea of Azov. If and when Moscow overplays its hand, Washington should rally fellow seafaring states to oppose Russian encroachment. Such Russian overreach could translate into Western advantage. Finally, the United States government must devise a strategy and develop the military tools to restore American mastery of the marginal seas. Force ultimately underwrites the international legal order, including its saltwater component. Russia and China have deftly integrated shore-based weaponry, anti-ship and anti-air missiles, fast patrol craft and submarines, and the like, into their maritime defenses. Their goal be to make things tough for the United States Navy, which presides over freedom of the sea should the American fleet ever venture into their environs. The logic of anti assets cuts both ways. The United States and allied military should harness this, fielding assets denial forces and strategies of their own to make things just as tough on Russia and China. Seashores and coastal waters bristling with armaments be hardly a desirable solution, but it's the best of a bad lot. A feeble response would endanger a system that serves the seagoing world well, as well as the world economy. 
Washington must push back, and it must push back hard. It doesn't have a choice. You might say, oh, there's always a choice. We could hold back. We could withhold. No, you can't. Because Putin's perfecting his broader border plan. From the Kremlin's pro-Trump meddling in 2016 to its threats to Ukraine, Georgia, and other border states, nearly everything has gone Vladimir Putin's way. While the Western media were focused on Russian President Vladimir Putin's violent escalation of his conflict with Ukraine, another nation on Russia's border, Georgia, voted in a runoff presidential election on Wednesday last week that will help determine its own geopolitical direction, Moscow or the West. Though the Georgian election got far less attention, both events were critical tests of the Russian leader Vladimir Putin's relentless efforts to resurrect as best he can a sphere of influence over the former Soviet republics. And with a dazzling array of methods such as creeping annexation, stealthy assassination, and digitally undermining democracy everywhere. In the case of Georgia, which already be doing Putin's bidding by and large, those methods have included outright coercion, bribery, and vote buying, hate speech, voter fraud, According to Transparency International and other non-governmental organizations that are directly against the Russian propaganda machine of WikiLeaks, true transparency networks, Putin's efforts were intended to wrangle support for the Russia-favored candidate Salom Jurabishvili and weaken her opponent Grigor Vezhadze, the heir to the exiled pro-Western former president Mikhail Shakashvili. Jurabishvili won, I regret to say, in an election that an international monitoring mission described as skewed by an increase in the misuse of state resources. In effect, Putin is trying to do more successfully in Georgia what he ultimately failed to do in Ukraine, rig the electoral system to install a Moscow-friendly puppet government, a satellite state. He appears perfectly willing to use violence when necessary, as he did invading parts of Georgia in 2008 and in annexing Crimea after his Ukrainian stooge, President Viktor Yunukovych, fled in the face of an anti-government uprising in 2014. While Americans were addressing their first cases, not even receiving attention of the AFM biocidal virus unleashed by the plague warriors, of Vladimir Putin as an advance operation for what he intends to unleash on your children in 2020. And Putin appears to be getting better at this game of co-opting his neighbors with a combination of threats, subterfuge, and force. Georgia, unlike Ukraine, has been fairly docile since 2012. And these days, Putin be fortunate in his adversaries, especially United States President Donald Trump. Obviously, For the Kremlin, Trump's election involved far more than luck. So I use the term Putin being fortunate in his adversaries loosely. From Trump's first moments in office to his obsequious, obsequious, psychophantic performance in Helsinki. To what's expected to have been a buddy talk at the G20 in Buenos Aires. To have taken place today. Cancelled only in light of the Mueller investigations back home showing you how domestic politics can impact the world from anywhere on earth. The United States president has given the Kremlin every encouragement it seeks. Just as he failed to directly criticize Putin's violent intervention in Ukraine this week, Trump last week shrugged off the murder of political opponents by autocratic regimes saying the world is a very dangerous place. Trump was speaking of Jamal Khashoggi, the murdered Saudi journalist. But the message to the killers of many Putin opponents over the years, including Sergei Magnitsky, liberal leader Boris Nemtsov, journalist Anna Polskovskaya. The inference to all these victims of motherfucking Russia was clear. Good Russian. Anti-Putin Russian. 
The United States Deputy Secretary of State and Deputy National Security Advisor James Steinberg said, Donald Trump is an absolute godsend to Vladimir Putin. Trump has disarmed us in this battle. If everybody's the same and we allow our friends to murder their opponents, then we be no different than Putin. We be another turd in the toilet bowl waiting for the big flush. Regarding Ukraine, while well, Trump's outgoing United Nations ambassador, Nikki Haley, condemned the actions of the Russian military on Sunday in firing and seizing Ukrainian ships as yet another reckless Russian escalation. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo used similar language. Trump evinced his familiar moral equivalents. Either way, we don't like what's happening, and hopefully it'll get straightened out. Trump said there's good people on both sides. Good people on both sides. Like the good white supremacists worshipping the anti-gods who killed a breeding age white woman in sacrifice. Good people on the side of the anti-gods. At this point, your reality is not even worth living in. If you support Donald Trump, eat shit and die. After being criticized for a weak response, Trump later hinted he might not meet Putin in Buenos Aires after all. He told the Washington Post, oh, I don't like that aggression. But his national security advisor, John Bolton, at the time, said the sit-down was still planned. It's just they're going to make it secret. Trump's going to get secret orders when Putin and he happen to bump dicks in the bathroom. They're both going to go to the urinal and take a piss together, side by side. And Trump's going to get his orders. Now... You might think the motives for Trump's tacit cooperation with Putin be unclear. In his remarks, Trump has sometimes suggested he's correcting Washington's past mistake of fecklessly provoking Russia after the Coke War. And Trump's echoed critics about that Cold War, who say the West is partly to blame for Putin's anti-Western campaign by pushing eastward too aggressively with NATO. That's an alliance Trump mistrusts himself. All of this is what the alternative right always says. Oh, Russia wants war. Look at how close they put their nation next to our military bases. You know, all you people who talk about poor motherfucking Russia, the solution is simple. Why don't you motherfucking move there? If you all feel so bad for Russia, you love Russia so much, you think America is such an aggressor, why don't all you red Republican white trash pieces of shit and all you colored coons all you fucking house niggers, move to goddamn Russia and see how good the Russians treat you. The idiot I knew, Abdul Karim Hawk, wanted to move to Russia. The Russians are friends! Uh, let's see how he gets treated there as the only nigger in hundreds of miles. And maybe that motherfucking idiot will realize it's too late to move back to the United States. Now, critics and investigators know the Kremlin has compromising information about Trump and his businesses. My fangirl, Lena Shea, made a far better point. They don't need any compromising information. There's no need to have video of his being urinated on by a Russian prostitute. Putin just says, don't do as I say, I'm going to kill you. And Donald Trump is such a motherfucking chicken shit coward. He's scared of the Russians killing him because they could do it in a heartbeat, just like they did to people all over Britain and anywhere else in the world, inclusive the United States, over the past several years since the alternative right militias have become the projection of mafia-like power for the Russians in England and the United States on either side of the Atlantic and all over Europe. This week, Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was exposed as violating a plea deal over conspiracy charges related to when he was working for a pro-Russia political party in the Ukraine. And, as I said, he did hear what he couldn't do in the Ukraine. In an explosive development on Thursday, 
Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, admitted in federal court he lied to Congress about his ongoing efforts to negotiate a Trump Tower deal in Moscow during the 2016 presidential campaign in an effort to protect the candidate who was telling the public at the time no such talks were happening. That news raises new questions about Trump's honesty about his relationships in Russia. All in all, what Putin has created and Trump evidently be facilitating, obviously so, it all be a well-oiled Machiavellian influence machine in Eurasia, one that is executing a strategy against the West that two Kremlin thinkers once called Moscow's Velvet Revenge. In 1999, when Moscow was still reeling from its Cold War defeat under Boris Yeltsin, and Vladimir Putin was waiting in the wings as his deputy and successor, two strategists, Efim Ostrovsky and Pyotr Shedrovitsky wrote that Russia's great power resurrection would come by recreating the Russian world through a new global meta project. This would be realized largely through soft power, which has come to mean propaganda, bribery, fake news, disinformatia, interference in foreign elections. Today, the Kremlin's particular focus is what it considers its buffer zone. Countries of the former Soviet Union, or using Moscow's jargon, the near abroad. Military scenarios be likely to be implemented here regularly. The current standoff between Russian and Ukrainian warships in the Strait of Kursk be just one example. Things will get much, much worse. That buffer zone includes Georgia, which is why Putin has aggressively sought to control his politics since he invaded in 2008 and occupied the border regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Only last summer, Putin warned NATO against cultivating closer ties with Ukraine and Georgia, saying we will respond appropriately to such aggressive steps, which pose a direct threat to Russia. With his latest naval response, Putin appears to be trying to consolidate his control of the Azov Sea between Ukraine and Russia, while the West does not but wring its hands. The Kremlin be already deeply involved in Wednesday's Georgian presidential election. Though a largely ceremonial post in Georgia's parliamentary system, the presidency be considered a key bellwether ahead of the bigger 2020 elections. Those in Georgia and the United States. By several accounts, Wednesday's vote was heavily rigged by Bijina Ivinchivili, the mysterious billionaire chairman of the ruling Georgian Dream Party, who is considered an under-the-table ally of Vladimir Putin. Under Ivan Zhvili, the party has ruled parliament since 2012. Though neither candidate could afford to be overtly too pro-Russian, indeed both sides routinely accuse the other of being Putin stooges, Ivan Zhvili's choice, Zhvili, the French-born daughter of Georgian immigrants, has been very careful not to offend Moscow. Some observers have analyzed the anointing of Jorabishvili, who is nominally independent, like the independent parties in the United States under, you know, the great distraction of uh, the man that was being pushed for so long by Alex Jones and whose son now, of course, has taken up his stride as a libertarian or independent party monger. These people are an example in America of what went down in Georgia to a greater degree of success. All of this is more evidence of Putin's growing subtlety. What better way to suggest that Russia be not involved than to put up someone who was raised in the West? Now, despite her victory, Zhurabishvili has high unpopularity ratings in Georgia for appearing to cozy up to Russia. In other words, she got elected somehow, despite the fact that she has zero approval ratings. It's just like Donald Trump being elected through manipulation of the Electoral College only in Georgia, it was just outright theft of the electoral machines. 
Zhurbashvili has suggested that the 2008 war was Shakashvili's fault, not Vladimir Putin's, meaning the president of Georgia's instead of the president of Russia's. And organizers of Zhurbashvili's rallies have openly talked about cooperation with the Russian special agencies, the secret services. Now, under the Georgian Dream Party, the Georgian version of Ron Paul, Ram Paul, the attitude be, let's not irritate Russia. Also, with the rise of another party aligned with Zhurbashvili, the Patriots Alliance, it's the first time there's been a pro-Russian party in the parliament with leading politicians saying things like, we've never seen a country that benefited from NATO. That's kind of like saying we've never seen a human being who benefited from multivitamins. Now, the previous Shakashvili administration was very clear with their messages that Russia was the enemy. And the only way forward was to integrate into NATO, get closer to the European Union, and implement democratic reforms. With this Putinista administration in Georgia, for the first time we see demonstrations with Georgians saying Russian soldiers are heroes. That's kind of like saying the mass shooters in the United States are heroes. Thus, under Ivanishvili's shadowy power, Georgia's once promising democracy has increasingly become a component of the Russian power vertically dictated by Vladimir Putin. And after Georgevishvili turned out to be a weaker candidate than thought, leading to the runoff on Wednesday, that election was a runoff, the billionaire's rigging apparatus sprang into motion. Example like right here, on November 19th, Prime Minister Mamuka Bektadze announced that the debts of 600,000 potential voters would be paid off by a foundation owned by Ivanishvili's Kartu Bank. Like many Putin allies, Ivanishvili made his fortune in banking and metals, oligarch style, like back in motherfucking Russia. Wednesday's vote was thus an important indicator of whether Putin is getting better at the game of managed democracy, as it's oft called, meaning buying off your voters. I mean, hell, if they paid off my credit card debt in the United States, I'd vote Trump too. Except here in the United States, the white trash motherfuckers are just too goddamn cheap. They won't give any charity to a yellow man of color. It just sucks. But of course, over there in Eurasia, everybody's white trash. So buying each other off, fuck, it's like thumbing each other in the locker room. Oh, it's a white thumb up the ass. I guess it's all right. Now, since Putin's succeeding so well with purchasing managed democracy, he's not likely to stop trying. Putin's overall vision is first to create strategic depth for himself and make sure there's nobody on his borders that can threaten him. Second, it's to weaken and demoralize the West and keep folks preoccupied having to put out fires. Literally here in California. Putin's able to kind of pick and choose his spots and get away with what he can. What he's discovered is he can get away with everything. There isn't enough will anywhere in the world to stand up to him. Other than Japan. Where Shinzo Abe told him to go fuck himself. When he said let's end World War II. And the Japanese said, why? We won. The ultimate goal of the Kremlin's foreign policy and military campaigns is to destroy, or at least significantly diminish, United States and NATO influence wherever it exists. But the control over the buffer zone be the number one imperative. With Trump's America First policy, Putin's hands are pretty much open anywhere in the fucking world other than the Axis powers of Imperial Japan and Die New Verini Deutschland, the new United Germany under Angela Merkel. Against the combined second axis of United Germany and Imperial Japan, the Kremlin distinguishes four tiers of significance within its strategic Eurasian buffer zone. The first tier includes Ukraine, Belarus, or White Russia, most of Kazakhstan. Nations included in the fundamental definition of Russia by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Nobel Prize winning writer who was once an anti-Soviet hero in the West, but in his latter years came out as a fervent Russian natalist 
and a nationalist Putinist admirer. The second tier be the Caucasus, a region comprising southeastern Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. The third tier be Central Asia, or what Solzhenitsyn once called the underbelly of Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Putin's already extended his influence to most of these nations, as well as, more indirectly, the former Soviet bloc nations such as Hungary and Poland, where hate movements, what we would call hate groups, now serve as the national government. A critical tier for the West, or rather, the critical test, in the outer tier, the far abroad, that tier always known to the Russians as the rest of the world. That critical test for the West will come when Putin seeks to exert his influence in the fourth tier of Baltic states. Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, three nations that have significant Russian populations, but are also NATO member states. These were the states invaded by Josef Stalin that led to Hitler striking back with Operation Barbarossa because by invading these states of the Baltic littoral, Josef Stalin was intent on Slavicizing what had formerly been part of the Hanseatic League, militarily secured by the NATO of its day, the Teutonic Ordnung, or the Order of German Knights that had Germanized the Germanic populations of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Just as the invasion by Josef Stalin triggered Adolf Hitler and his multinational Operation Barbarossa, consistent not only of Germans, but Italians and Romanians and many other nationalities in the invasion of the Soviet Union because of their taking of these Germanic statelets, that too will be the tripwire for a Russia-NATO conflict. The big question be what violates Article 5 of NATO. The provision of the NATO treaty that says if a member be directly attacked, NATO promises to take such action as it deems necessary to restore security. Does it have to be a land invasion? And will the U.S. respond if, say, Narva, an Estonian town conquered by Peter the Great and located near St. Petersburg, which is populated predominantly by Russians, what if that witness is an unexpected uprising by its Russian-speaking population demanding secession, as Putin's been trying to encourage? Ukraine's new front is Europe's big challenge. There's plenty Europe should do to push back against Russia's latest attack on Ukraine before it gets to the point of the former member states of the Hanseatic League, formerly under security jurisdiction of the Teutonic Ordnung the Order of Teutonic Knights. Before it even comes to that, we've got to take into account Crimea, Ukraine, Moldova. In late August 2008, with Russian troops in control of large chunks of Georgia, French Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, not Kushner, Kushner, K-A-O-U-C-H-N-E-R, if I remember correctly, that French foreign minister voiced his fears about Russia's next targets back in August 2008. Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov responded by accusing his French counterpart of having a sick imagination. In retrospect, Kushner's imagination was nary sick enough. You've got to be really fucking sick to think like a goddamn Russian or one of their Red Republican insurgents. Now on Sunday, when Russian gunboats opened fire on a Ukrainian naval convoy and rammed a tugboat before seizing it in two Ukrainian gunboats, this flotilla had been traveling from the Ukrainian port of Odessa on the Black Sea to the Ukrainian port of Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. The Ukrainian vessels were trying to pass through the Kursk Strait that separates Russian-controlled Crimea from Russia. This marked a new phase in an emerging third maritime front between Ukraine and Russia, one likely to keep Europe busy for years to come. On a recent trip to Ukrainian towers 
and towns and villages on the Sea of Azov that was taken by journalists who took documentary footage that I reviewed, I'll admit on YouTube, I could see how the situation on land has settled into a relative calm, both sides having dug in and fortified the front line. Assaulting it now would be extremely costly in manpower for either side. But on the sea, the situation would be very different. There, the stage be set for two new crises of European security. Not Ukrainian, European. One stage, one crisis, relates to freedom of navigation. The other to the economic viability of eastern Ukraine as a whole. Since Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 and then constructed that bridge from Russia to Crimea, it's been in effective control of both sides of that strait. It significantly boosted its military capabilities in the Sea of Azov and in recent months started to quietly strangle the freedom of navigation of all vessels entering Ukrainian ports on that sea. The ramming this weekend belongs to this new trend. The United States and a handful of European states are currently making efforts to appear serious about supporting freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. But when it comes to the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, even European navies with the bolder governments behind them find it easier to tickle Chinese sensibilities on the other side of the goddamn world than to butt right up against Russian security sensitivities in Europe. Europe itself. As for Ukraine's economic security, large parts of its economy in the East depends on trade through ports on the Sea of Azov. Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea are farther away. Access infrastructure be poor. Transport much more expensive. The region already faces deep economic problems. Its infrastructure and production chains have been partly destroyed by the war. Exports entering through the port of Mariupol dropped 58% in recent years. Foreign investment has simply disappeared. Last month alone saw 13,500 ceasefire violations on just the Mariupol stretch of the front line by the motherfucking Russians. This is all-out act of frontal war. Full combat. For several months now, Russia's been taking advantage of this to press its aggressions. Earlier this year, Russian border guards began stopping, checking commercial seats, ships making for Ukrainian ports. And these delays, as I've already articulated, can cost a ship as much as 10,000 United States dollars to 12,000 United States dollars per day on each leg, making Ukrainian exports much less competitive on international markets, imports more expensive, local consumers poorer, in a region that's already impoverished and traumatized by the war, and large numbers of internally displaced persons. All this represents a huge escalation in economic warfare on Ukraine. Russia's introduced all manner of sanctions on Ukraine before, but now it's not just a question of restricting Ukrainian exports to Russia, but a concerted effort to harm Ukrainian trade with Europe and the Middle East. This be no small matter because Ukraine imports, or I'll try and remember the trade balance here. The reason this is so imperative is because Ukrainian exports, the Ukrainians export more to Arab nations than to Russia. So effectively sealing the Kyrgyz Strait is like Denmark preventing Russian ships from crossing the Danish Straits, penning them in the Baltic Sea, which is exactly what we should do to the motherfucking Russian bastards. In response. So besides watching and expressing grave concern, what can Europeans and Americans do? And I can tell you actually quite a lot. First, they can demonstrate diplomatic and symbolic support for freedom of navigation into and around the Sea of Azov, sending non-military ships into the sea would help sustain this principle. In other words, directly provoke the motherfucking Russians by sending civilian medical and food delivery supply ships into the Ukraine to help its starving children. And no, Russia will not attack a rammed third country ships. They're too fucking ballers. Like all bullies, they're too chicken shit. Second, Europeans and Americans can adopt something of an economic offset strategy for Ukraine. Some of these measures can be cheap and symbolic, like donating a couple of tugboats, such as the one rammed in the latest incident. Beyond symbolism, they can invest in rebuilding the roads and railways that could link parts of eastern Ukraine to the rest of the nation. 
and they can relax their restrictions on access to the European market for goods such as honey, grain, corn, and grape juice. Despite having a free trade area with Ukraine, the European Union retains quotas on several competitive Ukrainian exports. Finally, it's time to take the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe offshore. The OSCE has been the major actor in monitoring conflicts across the Eurasian landmass from the Balkans to Tajikistan. It currently has a monitoring mission in eastern Ukraine. But given that Europe's next security flashpoint be likely to be out on the water, the organization should start monitoring the Sea of Azov as well with drones and ships. Russia's provocations in the Kursk Strait aren't just a challenge to Ukraine, like Beijing in the South China Sea, Moscow seeking to undermine international maritime law, which will affect all of us. Even if you live in the middle of landlocked Mongolia, it will impact you. The Russian foreign ministry complained last week that Ukraine's trying to depict, even frame Moscow as the aggressive party in the Sea of Azov to force the West to increase sanctions on Russia. If this be a real Russian fear, Moscow should be the first to invite international monitors into the Sea of Azov to set the record straight. Which they will never do because they're the motherfucking aggressors, the belligerents. Whatever one thinks of Russian or Ukrainian behavior around the Sea of Azov issue, a good dose of international presence in what could become Ukraine's third front line after Crimea and the Donbass will only reduce the risks of future escalations on the Sea of Azov. The world must intervene. This is why when someone says we must respond, it's not opinion. You don't have a choice. If you choose not to act, it's like home invaders entering your home and you choose not to act. And then while you just let them tie you up to a chair and watch and they rape your son, your daughter and your wife. And you say you made a choice. How do you live with that choice? You don't. Your son, your daughter, and your wife will no longer live with you, and they would be fools if they did. Just like when America froze all Japanese assets, stopped all shipments of oil at the time that Japan was getting well over 90% of its oil from the United States, when, Saudi, when the United States was the Saudi Arabia of the world prior to World War II, when it orgasmed all of its petrol reserves, by giving every barrel they had free to the Soviet Union, the French Empire, the British Empire, all oil at that time, every drop came from the United States. At the time, they cut off oil to Japan and forced it to invade the Dutch East Indies to get its oil. Adolf Hitler declared war on the United States, and people said, oh, he was a fool to do so. He would have been a fool not to. He would have been next. By doing what he did, he gained Hitler, he gained himself and his Third Reich many years on the surface world in which to organize their exodus into Unterland. But you, on the other hand, in the United States, what kind of future do you face in the next war? Well, here's hoping past performance is an any indicator of future success. There's a book by Lawrence Friedman entitled The Future of War, A History, demonstrating that military futurists, like political pundits, have a terrible track record of predicting the future in their field of expertise. Friedman notably warns to avoid those who proclaim the ease and speed with which victory can be achieved while underestimating the resourcefulness of adversaries. Now, despite futurists' long, poor track record writing about the future of war, be a well-resourced industry within the military, in academia, and at think tanks. Because futurists are not evaluating or making judgments about contemporary events, they avoid critiquing those who hold powers today which prevents them from losing access to officials, being retaliated against, and generally harming their career advancement. Moreover, the penalties for making unsound or incorrect predictions be rarely incurred, and if they are at all, it's only in the distant future. Now, 
as a international security analyst, constantly fascinated with studying what is happening on the Earth today, I've oft tried to avoid predictions. And this was due in part to, of course, my total failure for being integrated into a think tank on the basis of my predictions being so accurate that I was told that no think tank would ever employ me. That I would simply have to learn to tell contractors what they want to hear. But it's also because my gulp feeling be that there's always a huge number of ongoing military activities that are understudied or underappreciated. And so, in that light, I think of the worst of the worst of scenarios, and I could think of literally a dozen of them, literally around 12. I counted on my fingers, I ran out, and I counted my two big toes. And there's dispiriting predictions about America's future wars that I can be proven wrong about only if essentially I were allowed to be your Vulcan intervention to prevent you from taking yourselves to the logical end course of your dead end road to nowhere that you're heading militarily now. First, I can tell you the commanders and forces responsible for their geographic areas or domains, cyber space most prominently, will do a very poor job at preventing conflicts against United States interests in those areas or domains, despite pledging that conflict prevention be their highest priority. Second, the United States military will not fight the adversary it believes it will fight. Now, I noted way back in 2012 when I first became an outspoken public informant that Pentagon officials have a terrible record of forecasting where they will fight, the sorts of challenges their forces will face in the field. It's a record that's only worsened since. Third, I can tell you America's armed forces will not fight the type of conflict that concept development and experimentation professionals conceive of strategists and planners plan for, or service members be trained and prepared to encounter. For civilian and military leaders will offer a buffet of vague justifications, humanitarian, economic, national interests, to defend going to war in order to obtain the widest possible support from Congress and American citizens. Fifth, civilian leaders will wildly underestimate the human and financial costs, duration, political consequences, and second-order effects of these wars in order to obtain the widest possible support from Congress and American citizens. Six, both civilian and military leaders will mislead Congress, prominent media members, and the general public about the overall conduct and progress of the war by emphasizing positive stories and trends that they themselves generate, while similarly dismissing outside critical viewpoints. See, this is why when Adolf Hitler was a squad leader in World War I, and people say, when he became the Fuhrer, the leader, why did he take the generals of the Prussian officer caste and hang a few, have a few shot, have some declared traitors, have others shamed for marriages to prostitutes and have them ostracized or fired? Why did he do all this to purge so much of his stuff? Because throughout World War I, he saw exactly what squad leaders in Vietnam saw. They saw their officer class patting each other and themselves on the back and slapping each other on the ass over complete military debacles and failures and defeats and calling them victories, reporting them as such back home to their own commander, the Kaiser, in World War I, or to the American taxpaying electorate in Vietnam. And as one of these squad leaders from that level of conflict on the front lines, when Adolf Hitler was in charge, he realized that generals are politicians in uniform. In order to fight a real war, you've got to take a number of them out to be hanged, a number of them out to be shot, and then the rest will begin to listen to reason and actually fight operational conflict instead of trying to attain military, or rather, attain political objectives through military means, while war be an extension of politics 
the waging of war be an entirely different matter separate from political concerns. Seventh, I can tell you Pentagon officials and military commanders will articulate the intended political and military objectives with such vagueness that they would be difficult to evaluate and nearly impossible to falsify. Eight, major media outlets will overwhelmingly portray the war as based upon narratives and information provided by the U.S. military itself like they did in the Gulf War I was part of, Operation Desert Storm, where journalists were embedded with the United States Marine Corps and with almost no other branch of service so that everyone thought the Marines had won the fucking war as they fought in World War II, as they fought in World War I! Vizhnets of individual heroism and service members' surprise homecomings will be emphasized over critical reviews of the conduct of the war itself or stories from civilians living in the impacted countries. Ninth, Congress will still not perform its congressionally mandated function of authorizing wars, nor its customary role of effectively overseeing them, which ideally would include monitoring, supervising, evaluating, and reviewing. Something Congress has never done since the United States military took over the United States in a junta called World War II. And tenth, during rare, intermittent congressional hearings about the war, commanders will assert that the military element of national power be insufficient without adequate diplomatic support. The elected members will collectively nod their heads in agreement and then quickly move on. Eleventh, military leaders will pledge to learn lessons from the war and to implement new practices that assure that any operational or tactical mistakes be not repeated. These lessons will be largely overlooked by the new commanders of the next war. And twelfth, politicians will selectively remember or forget how the war progressed and was concluded, if ever. We're still involved in Afghanistan and Iraq in what's becoming a war that may yet beat out World War II, but since World War II is still ongoing... Nothing's ever going to beat out World War II in length of time until we end World War II and declare peace with the Thousand-Year Reich in exile. Peace with Uterland. First, that'd have to mean we would need to recognize that Uterland exists. And, of course, these politicians, in their selective memory of remembrance and forgetting about how the war progressed or if it ever concluded, all this will be in context of justifying the inevitable forthcoming military intervention. In keeping with historical practice, most of them will predict that the next war will go better than the last one. Now all of us brings, all this brings me to the next war. You see, what happens at home impacts the world. Sheryl Sandberg, second in command at Facebook Incorporated, directed Facebook staff to research George Soros. According to the New York Times, the company's second-in-command made the request in an email to a senior executive in January this year. The email, which asked for information on Soros's financial interests, was sent days after the investor attacked Facebook in a speech at Davos, speaking about how Mark Zuckerberg's hate speech was denying the Holocaust and, of course, provoking violence against Muslims, Jews, minorities all over the world. All of this brings us back to the Israel of today, so supported by Mark Zuckerberg that he helped promote Russian propaganda along with the Russian hacking of our electoral system itself to make Donald Trump president, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, whom they've named General Hospital in San Francisco after, because he married a Chinese medical doctor from San Francisco. Mark Zuckerberg, who moved to Kauai, the very garden island on which our volcano crowned Princess of the Pacific, our Pacific correspondent Judith Ager, resides. That Mark Zuckerberg so violently supports Israel and his Zionism that he personally called to congratulate Donald Trump when he won the presidency and asked him, move that capital now. And Donald Trump, obeying Mark Zuckerberg as if he were the child of God, because all Jews are relatives of the boss, moved his recognition of the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. Donald Trump being the best president Israel ever had. And now, in Syria, state media says the nation's air defense systems have deterred a major bombardment of their military bases. 
from Israel. Syria says it repelled an enemy attack, but it won't name the enemy. Kind of like the new giant Germany will not name the people who tripwired Germany's Air Force One in an attempt to assassinate Angela Merkel. All fingers on this latest attack on Syria, a failure, point to Israel. There's a May 10th photograph from this year, released by the government-affiliated Central War Media in Syria, purportedly showing that nation's air defense systems intercepting Israeli missiles over Damascus's airspace. Israel tried to destroy the capital of Syria, tried to wipe Damascus off the map. Syrian state media said the nation's air defense systems deterred this major bombardment of military bases in the south of the nation again this late Thursday. And suspicion immediately falls on Israel, which has attacked military targets in Syria before. Citing military sources, Syrian television says its air force has successfully repelled enemy targets, didn't specifically identify any of these enemy or the targets, The Saudi-owned television network Al Arabiya reported that Israeli planes had attacked positions held by Iranian militias near the town of Kizwa, south of the capital of Syria, Damascus, Damascus in the Anglo bastardization. The Israeli army did not claim responsibility for the bombardment, has declined to comment on the report. It did say that a missile was launched from Syria towards the Israeli-held Golan Heights, but that it did not know if the missile had landed in Israel. Uh, That's pretty fucking lame. So per the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, during a Syrian surface-to-air missile launching, one launch was identified towards an open area in the Golan Heights. At this point, it remains unclear if the launch indeed landed in Israeli territory. IDF troops are searching the area. A reporter with state-run Syrian Arab news agency said the air defense systems had been able to stop all incoming missiles. None had reached their targets. None. In earlier reports that Syrian air defenses had shot down unspecified targets over Kizwa. All this began to merge now. Images posted online by individual Syrians showed a heavy bombardment and the contrails of anti-aircraft missiles against the night sky. Partisan girl is very infamous. She's considered a Syrian troll by all you white boys. She said breaking, Israel tried to attack Syria but failed to get past the S-300 air defense system. The Israeli army said reports that its aircraft had been hit were false. Syrian opposition forces reported that the bombing was taking place close to an area where the Iranian-backed Lebanese militia, Hezbollah, or Army of God, has a growing military presence that has deeply concerned Israel, which shares tense borders with both Lebanon and Syria. Iran and Russia are the principal allies of Syrian President Bashar Assad, whose government has been fighting a civil war for nearly eight years. Iran sponsors and trains several militias that support Syria's military effort. Israel fears Tehran is using the cover of war as a pretext to establish permanent military bases at short distances from Israel's border. Hezbollah, a regional powerhouse, has won significant victories over insurgent groups that held the border area, expelling them and allowing Iran to expand its positions in southern Syria into established military bases. The latest outbreak occurred hours after flight tracking services indicated that an Iranian cargo jet had landed in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. It is the first known Israeli military engagement in Syria since the downing of a Russian intelligence gathering jet on September 16th, when Syria's aerial defense system mistakenly targeted the plane after an attack by the Israeli Air Force near the Syrian city of Ladakia. In a radio interview earlier Thursday, Reserve Major General Amos Yadlin, a former head of military intelligence, said that Israeli airstrikes in Syria, a regular if infrequent occurrence since the start of the Syrian civil war, have been reduced to almost zero since the Russian plane was down because Vladimir Putin personally called Benjamin Netanyahu up and said, hey, you fucking kike, you're making things hard on us. So Yadlin, the head of the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, states he believes Russian anger over the jet's loss has been directed not only at Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whom Russian President Vladimir Putin has refused to meet ever since, but also at Iran, which was disrupting Russia's attempts to stabilize Syria by developing precision missile building facilities. 
one result, according to the Israeli, uh, Mr. Yadlin, Major General by rank, though retired, I believe, and now involved with academia, he says one result is that Iran is changing tactics and transferring some weapons-building capabilities from Syria to Iraq and Lebanon. So all of this be why the Trump administration is pivoting the fight in Syria towards war with Iran. The number of United States military personnel in Syria has steadily grown, and the rhetoric of the president, Trump, and members of his national security team continues to escalate against Iran based on old books written in the 1980s by Jerome Corsi, the man who helped get Trump elected through Roger Stone and all the other motherfuckers involved. And in this war, we've got 40,000 Syrian refugees trapped in a United States-created no-man's land The Trump administration's decision to withdraw support from groups battling the Syrian government has worsened the plight of those living in the Rukban camp. And, of course, there are my people, through my possession by the peacock angel, Malik Dodd, the Yazidi. We'll go into their situation, either when I've got our boy Justin on, our brother in battle, our man, or a girl, our lady, Judith Agert, should she return after the uh, Justin White guesting? For now, it's the bottom of the hour. I'm going to let our man Pavel Edward get some much sleep. It must be about uh, 12 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3. It must be about 3.30 a.m. over there. And I hope I've outlined for you why we're headed towards world war. Vladimir Putin, of course, has given secret orders standing in the Euro room next to Donald Trump that he attack Iran in the name of Israel. And Trump, of course, will do so. And so to protect motherfucking Israel and the new capital of the white world order, Jerusalem, America will go to war against Iran while Russia conquers the Black Sea and China conquers the Southeast. And in the end, the only victor will be motherfucking Israel. The people who stand in the way, Angela Merkel, the leader of the free world, out of new United Germany, and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of the Empire of Japan. And yet all you people can watch is goddamn Russian propaganda on television about the man in the high castle showing the Japanese and the Germans being bastards and occupying your shitty nation which they wouldn't even want to dirty the shine of their boots on by your tainted shit scum soil. And to wake you up from that psychotic fantasy that up is down, night is day, black is white, wrong is right. That's why Douglas Dietrich is here as the man on Russian Hill, your Vulcan intervention. You don't deserve me, but I'm stranded here. And we're stuck with each other. You're garbage. But I've worked with garbage all my life. Mercenaries that weren't worth a shit that I had to turn into fighting units. Marines that weren't worth a shit that I had to lead through ghoul-infested areas of the fucking desert. None of you are any better. But you've got one ace in the hole. You've got myself. And I've always been less man standing. All right, join us at our regular time on Sunday night with Justin White as our guest. Judith Aker will not be with us that night. Hopefully she will return on Wednesday or sometime shortly thereafter. In the meantime, my love unto those who deserve it. 
a slow and torturous degrading death unto my gang stalkers who have wished such upon myself and those I love, and have attempted to make it so. But for the rest of you working to work on, willing to work under my command, you have a future, and it's only my advisements that'll lead your children's children into a brighter world where trash like you no longer exist, and they deserve the respect, have earned the respect of human beings, and perceive other human beings of all ethnicities and religions of worthy of respect, should they be respectful in turn. The Russians aren't under Vladimir Putin. And the only thing that will solve the Russian problem is war. They've made it so. That's all they have to offer the world. That war against Russia and conceivably communist China, that becoming, will not be won without my advisements. But when it is won, the world will be left a much better place than today. Blessed night.